I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage. Here on GB News, we will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely right. unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 12 noon, a very good afternoon. You're with GB News Live, I'm Mark Longhurst, and coming up this Tuesday lunchtime, Harry faces up to the mirror. The Duke of Sussex takes to the stand in his hacking case against the newspaper group, how fair, uh, in what could be a very cross, cross-examination over a day and a half. Well, in his evidence so far, he said the tabloid press started him as a blank canvas, but then he was the Playboy Prince, the failure, the dropout, or in my case, he said, the thicko, the underage drinker and the irresponsible drug taker. The list goes on, he says. We'll have the latest live from court. A state of emergency and a mass evacuation of tens of thousands as the Russians are blamed for destroying a Ukrainian dam, flooding cities, towns and villages. The European Council says it's clearly qualifying as a war crime. We're live at the scene as a huge rescue effort gets underway. And also coming up, 79 years on rather since the D-Day landings, we'll hear from a man who landed on the beaches of Normandy on that longest day. First, the latest news headlines with Rory. Thank you very much, Mark. The Duke of Sussex accuses the press of having blood on their hands during his cross-examination at the High Court in London. Prince Harry has given evidence against the publisher of the Daily Mirror over alleged unlawful information gathering. In his witness statement, he says he felt physically sick to learn there were eight payments to private investigators in relation to his mother and 135 separate payments related to him. He says he realises that his acute paranoia of being constantly under surveillance was not misplaced. Mirror Group newspapers denies all allegations. 
Meanwhile, the US government will be challenged in court over its decision to give the Duke of Sussex a visa in 2020. It's after Prince Harry's admission of illegal drug use in his book Spare. It's not known if he admitted this for the visa application. US official policies say that visa applicants who are found to be drug users or addicts are inadmissible. ITV has been questioned in Parliament over the broadcaster's handling of Philip Schofield's affair. Magnus Brook from the management team attended Parliament's Culture, Media and Sport Committee. Questions have been raised over how much bosses at the channel knew about Schofield's affair with a younger male colleague. The COVID-19 inquiry is due to compare unredacted WhatsApp messages and notebooks from Boris Johnson to redacted copies provided by the Cabinet Office. Hugo Keith QC, counsel for the COVID inquiry, says Boris Johnson's locked former phone had been handed to the government with the hope of obtaining his WhatsApp messages from before May 2021. He also told the inquiry that Cabinet Office is only seeking to ensure that national security protected material was not going to be disclosed by Mr Johnson. Mr Johnson has offered to provide the inquiry with assistance directly. We're grateful to him for his cooperation and the inquiry team has been liaising with his legal team to arrange for the inspection of the unredacted WhatsApps that he had provided to the Cabinet Office but which he has had returned to him. We expect to begin that inspection this week. The Labour leader says the transition to green energy will establish a new business model for Britain. Speaking at the GMB Unions conference, Sir Keir Starmer has rejected the idea of onshore wind until jobs are secured. It's after GMB General Secretary Gary Smith expressed concerns that the party's stance may lead to a sudden drop in jobs, referring to it as a cliff edge. Sir Keir has also vowed his party would ensure there are more renewable jobs and strengthen society. So I want to be clear. Everything I do, all the changes we're making, are in the service of this goal. They are grounded in a new project which understands that the Labour Party can only restore hope in Britain if we once again become the natural home for working people. Thousands of people are being evacuated from their homes after an attack on a two-mile-long dam in southern Ukraine. Russia says it was a terrorist act by Ukraine because its counter-offensive is faltering. But Ukraine accuses Russia of causing the widespread flooding. The Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, is in the country meeting President Vladimir Zelensky and says the best thing Russia could do now is withdraw their troops immediately. Pope Francis has been taken to a hospital in Rome. The Pope, who is 86, is believed to be there for a health checkup. He spent five days in medical care earlier this year due to a lung infection. He's also skipped audiences due to a fever last month. The Vatican has not commented. The Veterans Memorial Service has taken place to celebrate the 79th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy. The service commemorates the anniversary of Operation Overlord, which marks the momentous 1944 Normandy landings in France. These landings mark the beginning of Allied Forces' mission to liberate mainland Europe from Nazi Germany during World War II. It's is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. Back to Mark. And welcome back to GB News Live with Prince Harry telling a packed courtroom in his hacking case against Mirror Group newspapers that he was portrayed as the playboy prince, the failure, the dropout, or in my case, he said, the thicko, the cheat, the underage drinker and the irresponsible drug taker. He outlined the damage that tabloid press stories had done to himself and his relationships over decades. He went on to say that former editor Piers Morgan had subjected him and his wife Meghan to a barrage of horrific personal attacks and intimidation. He also revealed that he had spoken of former royal butler Paul Burrell, and we apologise for the language, 
as a two-face SH1T. Let's get more with our Royal Correspondent, Cameron Walker, who is outside the court. Cameron, we've had to wait 130 years for the first royal testimony in a witness box. It certainly seems worth waiting for in terms of uh, those reporting on the case. It certainly is, Mark. If only cameras were allowed in court, I think it would be better than any Netflix series that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have done. The um, Mr Green Casey, who is representing Mirror Group newspapers and is cross-examining Harry as we speak in the witness box, started off by talking broadly about the 148 articles which uh, Prince Harry alleges were written with information obtained unlawfully by Mirror Group newspaper uh, journalists. And he asked Harry specifically... When did he read the articles and when did he feel distressed from those articles? Uh, and Prince Harry, to be frank, couldn't recall the exact moment he read each article individually and certainly not at the time of publication. He spoke about friends at school reading the articles and perhaps reacting badly around him and he also talked of his legal team uh, talking through these particular articles with him 20 or so years later. And now what um, Mr Green, Andrew Green Casey is doing is forensically going through in minute detail the 33 articles which are being tested in this case. So the first one dates from the 16th of September 1996 um, and Prince Harry is complaining that details of his feelings about the divorce of his parents, Diana, Princess of Wales and Prince Charles, now of course King Charles, and the ill health of a family friend. He believes that information was obtained through phone hacking. Now, Mr Green asked Prince Harry, um, does he recall having a mobile phone in 1996? Because in Prince Harry's witness statement, he clearly says that he didn't get his first mo mobile phone until he attended Eton College in 1998, two years after that article was written. Prince Harry responded by saying that his security team at Ludgrove School, where he was studying, had a landline phone in a private room for him to use. And then Mirror Group newspaper barrister, Mr Green, made the point, then that's not a mobile phone, is it? To which Prince Harry responded, then it could have been his mother, Princess Diana's phone in that particular uh, article. Um, Mr Green then went on to talk about uh, a, a separate article talking about his brother, his, his dad's um, upset by a friend being particularly ill and he's talking about uh, invoices which the journalist who wrote the article reportedly uh, paid to private investigators who Prince Harry believes um, are unlawfully obtained information about him. And Mr Green put it to Prince Harry but he's just speculating that the information was obtained unlawfully lawfully due to the fact that uh, these particular companies had used um, information in the past obtained unlawfully to write other articles and yeah. Prince Harry said it was highly suspicious that those companies had used unlawful means in the past but nonetheless Mr Green made the point that that is just speculation and then I think perhaps this second article which Mr Green went on to talk about um, just a reminder that that is the barrister representing Mirror Group newspapers it's it's an article dated from 2000 about uh, Prince Harry and his brother William missing the Queen Mother's 100th birthday pageants to go climbing in uh, Yorkshire. Now, Prince Harry again maintains that he believes that it was unlawful information gathering uh, which led to that information being published yeah. in the Mirror. But then Mr Green um, referred to two articles written by the Mail on Sunday and the Daily Mail written a day, a day and then a week before this article in the Mirror was written, which had pretty much the same information and then Mr Green made the point then why did the mirror journalist not just take the information from the mirror uh, from the daily mail or the mail on sunday rather than unlawful means so the case yeah. continues he is getting uh, a bit in the grilling but clearly this is a very early stages of this trial mark yeah, ju just to explain to people, of course, because this is a civil case, there's no jury as such, this evidence is before the judge who then has to decide on the balance of probability. So what we've heard from uh, the prince so far is effectively in a witness statement. Now, Andrew Green, as you've indicated, will be cross-examining, possibly for not just today but tomorrow. And we remind ourselves that I think the Legal 500 website says he's an opponent to be feared 
a punchy and aggressive court style, uncompromising and relentless, uh, particularly at home with cross-examination. Another describing him has a, the eye of Sauron-like focus. So um, this could be quite a difficult time from now on uh, as these things are tested, because clearly Mirror Group newspapers says you need direct evidence of these various incidents actually taking place. Yeah, exactly. And I've been in that courtroom for the last hour and a half, Mark, and what has become very clear is that Mr Andrew Green KC is incredibly... Uh is incredibly is, is giving a lot of detail and is asking Prince Harry about a lot of detail. He he knows the ins and outs of every article that Prince Harry alleges was uh, written with information obtained through unlawful information gathering. And from being a you know a witness inside the courtroom, it appears Prince Harry isn't particularly across some of that details. Now he may well pull it back. Um, when, his, his, when his own lawyer, David Sherborne, uh, talks to him in open court. But at the moment, there is a lot of specifics which Andrew Green is asking Prince Harry about, and Prince Harry appears to not be able to give specific answers. Uh, and, and, Mr, uh, and Mr Green is essentially just putting it to Prince Harry that you are speculating rather than having concrete evidence. But to be fair to Prince Harry, he made the point that a lot of the, un, the alleged unlawful information gathering, which happens in this time period, late 90s, early 2000s, was done, he believes, from his understanding, by using burner phones when it came to phone hacking, and therefore it's untraceable and all the evidence is now lost. So Prince Harry is saying he doesn't have a lot to go on, but he yeah. believes it's highly suspicious that this information was out there in the public's domain, uh, and he believes that it was unlawful information gathering uh, that cause these articles to be written in the first place. Cameron, for the moment, thank you for that. Back to you, of course, as the case continues uh, this afternoon. But let's bring in our former royal butler to Princess Charles, Sir Harry and William Grant Harold. Grant, thank you for your time. Uh, extraordinary uh, detail in this witness statement that he's given, outlining the damage that he believes was done to him, the paranoia, and explaining why relationship was so difficult, because he obviously thought others were giving press the details about these various occurrences. Mm. Yeah, it's, do you know, it's, it's extraordinary listening and, and watching all this because the, the Harry, the Prince Harry that I knew when I was there was somebody that was, he was quite a private individual. Um, he had many close friends, you know, he spent a lot of time at Highgrove and also at Eton. I was unaware of any of this. It doesn't mean to say it wasn't taking place, but it, it yeah. shows you that obviously there was things going on that, that we didn't realise and obviously he's saying has affected him, um, which I can believe, I can understand. I understand why he's wanting to kind of defend and, and do this, but this is, we don't have seen this. The monarchy, you know, the royal family always keep away from these kind of things and it's extraordinary to see the fifth in line to the throne in a court case giving evidence. Well, we understand that the king did advise him not to proceed with this, describing mm. it as, as suicidal in terms of uh, mm. what the fallout may be, but he clearly mm. believes that this is a moment that the, the tabloid press need to be taken to account. I mean, did you get a sense in the royal household at the time uh, that this would be simmering away for so many years? No, not at all. I mean, as you know, Matt, over the years, there's been, there's been inquiries and different things that have taken place, and the phone hacking has been me mentioned before. But I, I was unaware that this was going to kind of become what it's become today. And I'm not surprised that the king's advised him against it because, you know, as I said, the, the, the monarchy don't get involved in things like this. And, they, and I read one of the, there was a, a thing that I saw where he obviously he's, he's mentioned the government, he's been the government into it as well. And these are just things that they don't do because they, they keep away from this. It's, it's not advisable for the monarchy to be doing this kind of thing. And even though a lot of people say he's no longer part of the royal family, he is still a councillor of state, he is in fifth in line to the throne, and he is the son of the king. So it's quite damaging what's going on. Uh, including a rather unflattering description of Piers Morgan, uh, as he might, as a former editor of the Mirror <laughs> Group newspapers, but also for another former royal butler, Paul Burrell. Um, perhaps this um, might go down rather differently with, with Mr Burrell than it will with Piers Morgan.
Well, possibly. I mean, I, I was I was interesting to hear the kind of names that have been kind of put around. I'm glad, I'm glad I haven't been mentioned so far in any of this. But I do, you know, I think people that, you know, when you hear these kind of things being said about them, uh, wouldn't surprise me if they retaliate or say something in response. But this is the problem, Mark. It's opening up a, it's almost opened up a hornet's nest. And this is what I, I think they should be advising. I'd be advising them not to do this. In fact, the other day, I made a comment where I said, I think the best thing for them to do is to continue to lead his private life that he wanted in in the states, because I, but as I said, I understand that he obviously feels strong about this, but there's just things that royals just don't do, and this is certainly one of them. You don't have a royal member of the royal family in a, a court testifying; it's just right. not the done thing. But th there is another analysis, and that is that perhaps the realization that even if you're a royal, you hurt if things are said or things are done to you. It may actually Absolutely. engender rather more sympathy for him. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Mark, you will remember his late mother, Diana Prince yeah. of Wales. I mean, she quite often spoke out and, and voiced, you know, what, what she felt. And so it's not a new thing by any means, a member of the royal family kind of speaking out. It's just we haven't seen any of this happen for quite some time. But of course, you know, at the end of the day, I was lucky enough to get to know them. They're human beings. They're like you and me. They, they hurt, they cry, they laugh. You know, they are like everyone else. But I think maybe this is a, a sign of things to come. Maybe with yeah, members of the royal yeah. family, if they feel that they've been attacked or they need to defend themselves, maybe they will. Maybe this is just the start of, of how it's going to be with members of the royal family. Grant, thank you for your reaction. We'll see what emerges, of course, thank in that you. court hearing later on. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, well, let's just remind you that uh, this is what's been uh, the evidence so far, some of the uh, main lines from his witness statement, indeed, about the uh, unlawful alleged actions by uh, Mirror Group newspapers. Um, the quote is, it's not my career and professional life that the defendants, journalists, were interested in, but very private, raw emotions between me and my partner. It's so violating. That's in uh, reaction to uh, Chelsea Davy and uh, the breakup of their relationship. Went on to say, I would say their actions affected every area of my life. Uh, it created a huge amount of paranoia, said the prince, in my relationships. I felt that I couldn't trust anybody, which was an awful feeling for me, especially at such a young age. Indeed, about his relationship with Chelsea Davy, the prince went on to say, we couldn't even meet in private or have uh, arguments over the telephone. It was just that feeling of being under surveillance all the time. And uh, just to update you, uh, at the moment, Andrew Green Casey is questioning the Duke about uh, an article back in 1996 about his parents' divorce, putting it to the Duke uh, that the Princess of Wales had already spoken publicly about that split. So, uh, as Cameron was saying, some forensic cross-examination underway at the moment. We'll update you from the court. Also coming up, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, Russia blamed for destroying a Ukrainian dam that's now flooded cities, towns and villages, tens of thousands being moved to safety. Uh, Europe is uh, describing it as another war crime. We'll have the latest from the scene. Stay with us. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. <laughs> We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion. Looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now, welcome back to GB News Live. In the last hour, the UK has said it's offering additional support to Ukraine after that huge dam in the south of the country was destroyed. Major evacuations are underway. The Ukrainian authorities blaming the Russians. The European Council says it clearly qualifies, in their view, as a war crime. Well, cities, towns and villages in the region facing significant flooding now. And reacting to the attack, Britain's Foreign Secretary James Cleverley calling it an abhorrent act and a catastrophe, but Moscow still denying claims of any involvement. Let's get the latest now with our security editor, Mark White, who joins us uh, in the studio. Um, still some extraordinary pictures coming in, Mark, and uh, this footage of the explosion as well. I mean, indications, according to the Ukrainians, that it was a controlled explosion, mines even, that they had warned about uh, in terms of breaching the, the wall of the dam. Yeah, the Ukrainians claim it was an explosive device within the dam itself, and certainly when you see the, the footage that seems to have been from CCTV to the side of the dam, uh, filming it at night, you see a massive uh, explosion. It's like that something from the Dam Busters film, isn't it? No, absolutely, you know, it's, it's just it's, a huge. That, that explosion. White, that's the explosion, yeah. and that's the aftermath there. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, a significant. Uh, breach there of the dam and the water starting to uh, pour out as we can see immediately yeah and then of course the uh, within the the hours uh, of that explosion uh, more of the dam gave way so now there's an absolute torrent that is uh, cascading down the Dnipro valley uh, but is affecting both communities that are controlled by Ukraine, such as the city of Kherson, and also uh, communities that are controlled by the Russian side, uh, such as uh, the, the town of Kukovka, which, of course, the dam is named after. And, and the, the city of Kherson could be affected as well. The whole of Crimea gets its drinking water from this huge... It's described as almost like an inland sea, the reservoir that was behind this dam. Now, the Russians say, no, we're not involved. However, they've also observed that this will make it difficult for Ukrainian forces to cross the Dnipro as a major barrier to launch their counter-offensive. Now, the two things don't quite tally, do they? Well, I mean, when you're looking at it in terms of, you know, both sides effectively having a lot to lose from the flooding of areas that they control, that is true. But if you're then looking at the sort of uh, uh, the military strategy that's in play here and halting mm. uh, an, uh, an expected Ukrainian advance, then it could well be an objective of Russia to take out what is a road, a big road across that dam itself. It's yeah. just over two miles long. And when you're the Ukrainian military, you don't have uh, air superiority. It's difficult to move 
troops and certainly armoured vehicles, you require roads or at least yeah. flat ground to be able to do that. And when you've got a natural obstacle like the Dnipro River, yeah. which is massive, you need those crossing points. And it's interesting that the European Council has already made its uh, views known that it's uh, basically a, a, a prima facie war crime, they say, because this is civilian infrastructure rather than any kind of military infrastructure as they see it. Yeah, and heads of the Baltic uh, states as well have come out with a similar statement. Uh, they are clearly uh, pointing the finger squarely at Russia. Uh, for their part, uh, the British government and indeed the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly has said they're still assessing uh, the events overnight. Um, the UK MOD uh, saying that uh, as far as this counter-offensive is concerned, of course, that a uh, long-awaited Ukrainian counter-offensive. They are noticing now uh, military uh, incursions, or at least fighting, in a number of regions right, right along that front line between Ukraine and Russia. What it's not marked, this counter-offensive, is a D-Day-type landing scenario where you're seeing a massive push of armour and troops yeah. uh, along a front line. It's in strategic points along the front line, but it looks as though the counter-offensive is underway now. And, and interesting that suggestions are there could be some nine battle groups basically following NATO war plans, that they have these groups together where you have the engineers, you have the combat troops, you have the armoured troops and so on, uh, in a joint operation. It, it's quite carefully mapped out. Yeah, and about another four brigades uh, in reserve able to sort of move to different areas at short notice. But, yes, they are being advised of course, by NATO military leaders. And they, uh, on the NATO side, are fully cognizant of the fact that the Ukrainians, while they have been reinforced with a lot of weaponry, uh, weaponry and armour from NATO uh, and they've been training their troops, they are still, in terms of the sort of balance of power, yeah. it is on the Russian side. It's a far superior force and everybody makes... Uh, almost light of the fact that, oh, they're dealing with, you know, Soviet-era weaponry. But there's a lot They of are it. a very potent yeah. force, yeah. the Russians. And bearing that in mind, the NATO strategy here is passed down to the Ukrainians, which is clear the Ukrainians are adopting, is to go for strategic positions, not to do any kind of big line yeah. um, push... Uh, over a wide stretch of land, but to look for these weak points, um, these strategically yeah, important yeah. points, and to press in those areas. Mark, thank you for that. And, of course, we'll keep monitoring the situation. Indeed, let's speak now to a uh, Ukrainian member of Parliament, uh, Kira Rudik, who obviously keeps us updated on the situation there. Kira, thank you for your time today. Um, I, I see that the latest from Reuters news agency is describing catastro or catastrophic discharge of the river uh, flowing downstream. What's the latest you're getting there? Hello, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, right now, our main concentration is uh, on saving people and making sure that people are evacuating. We are extremely concerned about people who are at their temporary occupied territories and if they are getting enough help. Uh, we know that the water is just coming and will continue going up uh, throughout today's day. Uh, we are encouraging volunteers to go that way to help people with whatever is possible. And this is the main goal. However, I understand that uh, the uh, Ukraine Atomic Energy Agency is saying that the nuclear plant, which is further upstream, of course, um, that seems to be OK, that the situation is not critical there. It is not critical. However, let's look at the situation from a different perspective. President Zelensky has warned the war world uh, in October last year that Russians have mined the Kakhovka power plant dam and that we are one step away from, from the real tragedy. Right now it happened. For the last year, we have been saying to the world, look, the situation on the Parisian nuclear plant is critical. And again, we are one step away from a nuclear tragedy. And if Russians are good in anything, they're good in committing uh, 
um, the false flag operations. So let's do possible, all possible and impossible things to make sure that we secure the station. As of right now, the situation is not dangerous, but we cannot guarantee that it would not change. And we are calling for the international support for the UN to make sure that we instill an international spectators in the nuclear plant, because we do not know what's going to happen there. And uh, coming back to um, the results of the terrorist attack today in the morning, it is uh, not only a humanitarian disaster, it's ecological disaster that we will not not uh, be able to repair in decades. And yeah. the harm that is committed against our country is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, the, the European Council has already declared it uh, it sees this as, as a, a war crime uh, because this is obviously a civilian infrastructure target, not actually anything that's military. Um, and I, I gather that the Ukraine are calling for an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council um, in what they uh, described as a, a Russian terrorist attack. But on the ground, can you give us an idea of what sort of... Um, things you're having to put in place? Because, I mean, I, I gather the, the estimate could be tens of thousands of people affected by this. Right now, it's very early to say about uh, the amount of casualties, but again, our concentration is to make sure that we get as many people out as possible. Our emergency services are working. Our soldiers are helping out to get people out. And um, there are many people who are not taking it seriously because the water did not come up, but we know that it can happen really rapidly. You have probably already seen videos and you are showing them now of houses basically flowing in the water and this is what is happening throughout the region and it will be happening more because right now we are not at the peak of the um, of the water going up yeah. and this is uh, of course terrifying you know uh, there is um, there is a huge difference between uh, between us and Russians. Uh, we talked about that, that. There is a difference between democratic regime and authoritarian one, because for democracy, human's life is the most um, expensive currency, and for authoritarian regime, it's the cheapest one. So we see that they, to stop us from the counteroffensive, they would not stop at anything, at killing uh, potentially hundreds of people and uh, killing their own soldiers just to uh, prove the point that um, that a Ukrainian army would not be able to march forward. Kira, as ever, thank you very much indeed uh, for updating us here in GB News. And, of course, uh, we'll update people as we get more news there on the ground as well. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, indications uh, that uh, uh, those uh, movements of, of uh, people being moved to safety are underway. Um, but uh, in terms of the nuclear power plant, it is being cooled at the moment. That's the latest update we've got. Still to come, 79 years since the D-Day landings, we'll be hearing from a veteran who was on the beaches of Normandy that longest day. First, an update on the headlines with Rory. Thank you very much, Mark. The Duke of Sussex accuses the press of having blood on their hands during cross-examination at the High Court in London. Prince Harry is giving evidence against the publisher of the Daily Mirror over alleged unlawful information gathering. In his witness statement, he says he felt physically sick, sick to learn there were eight payments to private investigators in relation to his mother and 135 separate payments related to him. He says he realises that his acute paranoia of being constantly under surveillance was not misplaced. Mera Group Newspapers denies all allegations. One of ITV's senior management team has told MPs there's a significant system of safeguarding and duty of care at the company. Magnus Brook has been questioned in Parliament over the broadcaster's handling of Philip Schofield's affair with a younger male colleague. He also says bullying is absolutely in breach of his company's code of conduct amid allegations of a toxic work environment. Downing Street says the government is willing to agree another way forward on taking legal action against the COVID inquiry. The inquiry asked the Cabinet Office to return Mr Johnson's notebooks to him by June the 12th to compare them to the redacted copies already provided by the Cabinet Office. The inquiry's chairwoman, chairwoman Baroness Heather Hallett, says she will not be commenting on the legal row due to pending litigation. 
Thousands of people are being evacuated from their homes after an attack on a two-mile-long dam in southern Ukraine. Russia says it was a terrorist act by Ukraine because its counter-offensive is faltering. But Ukraine blames Moscow for causing the widespread flooding. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, is in Kyiv meeting President Vladimir Zelensky and says the best thing Russia could do now is to withdraw their troops immediately. That's you up to date, but you can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, that is gbnews.com. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. At the Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. News Channel. Uh, welcome back to GB News Live. Just to remind you, Prince Harry is being cross-examined at the High Court uh, in his case against the publisher uh, of the Daily Mirror, Mirror Group Newspapers. Uh, plenty of bombshells being released in the court uh, hearing. Just to remind you earlier, the Prince criticising not just the state of the British press, but also the government uh, over the alleged unlawful actions of journalists. The Duke saying, our country is judged globally by the state of our press and our government, both of which I believe are at rock bottom. Uh, going on to say earlier that um, in his witness statement, uh, he said that he uh, believed 
tabloids had hacked his voicemail when he was at school at Eton, would constantly be leaving and receiving voicemails as text messaging was less common then, and it would include incredibly private and sensitive information, uh, his statement said, also suggesting that newspaper stories about rumours that his father was Diana, Princess of Wales' former lover, James Hewitt, were aimed at ousting him from the royal family. Uh, the statement in courts are referring to an article in the People newspaper in 2002 with a headline, Plot to Rob the DNA of Harry, which reported a bid to steal a sample of the Duke's DNA to check his parentage and uh, indication about, of course, all these stories and the damage that it had on him and his relationships. We'll keep you updated uh, as we get more from that court hearing. But today, we're also marking 79 years since one of the most significant events of World War II, D-Day, often recognised as having played the crucial role uh, in the Allies defeating Germany, uh, Operation Overlord. It's so important we mark the day every year in recognition of those who gave their lives for our freedom, starting on those beaches of Normandy. Our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper has been speaking to one veteran who landed on the beaches that day back in 1944. Under the air cover, the great fleet of little ships marched on. 79 years ago came the beginning to the end of World War II. So great was the speed of this advance that the retreating Germans were never given the chance to get organised. On the 6th of June, 1944, what's now known as D-Day took place. Tens of thousands of Allied troops invaded the beaches of Normandy by land, air and sea. Just one of those was Bernard Morgan. The thing I remember mostly, and I should never forget, is seeing our troops digging the dead bodies out of the sand on the Normandy beaches. Bernard enlisted on his 18th birthday, determined to play his part. He was trained up as a code breaker, and on D-Day, he was the youngest RAF sergeant to land in Normandy. We were anchored seven miles off the uh, coast on the, on the night before D-Day. Our battleships were behind us. They were firing at the Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall were firing back. And I had to man a Bren gun for two hours on the deck of this landing ship tank. And uh, I tell the truth, I was very frightened. As a trained codebreaker, Bernard had access to a telex, a device used during World War II to communicate electronically. As a result, he knew that the war was coming to an end two days before VE Day. Well, we couldn't believe it when we got this message to say the war would finish in two days' time. Nobody to be advised at all. It gave us a great thrill to think that we'd be playing a part in it and our little bit had helped to bring it to an end. Now, almost eight decades later, and Bernard still works regularly with the Royal British Legion to remember his fallen comrades. I always think of the poor lads who gave their lives for the freedom that we enjoy today. Sailors, soldiers, airmen and civilians who gave their lives so that we could live a free life. They're the ones who are, I call the heroes. Flower Deck Memorials speak of the gratitude of a whole people. To the world will, of course, always remember D-Day, a day that made all the difference in winning the Second World War. Sophie Reaper, GB News. Now, let's uh, update you on some breaking news we're getting from the Culture, Media and Sport Committee. This is um, in concerning this morning, the ITV programme and, of course, uh, Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby. Now, a boss of ITV uh, who's been at that committee, Magnus Brook, who's Group Director of Strategy, Policy and Regulation of ITV, has just told the committee that comments by this morning editor Martin Frizzell were extremely ill-judged. Uh, he was being questioned by MP John Nicholson. Um, Nicholson called uh, Frizzell's remarks to a journalist uh, concerning toxic culture as outrageously dismissive and flippant on camera about a serious uh, issue. Martin Frizzell had been uh, approached by Sky News reporter uh, and 
asked if there was a toxic work environment on the show. The editor replying, I'll tell you what's toxic, and I've always found toxic, aubergine. Do you like aubergine? Do you? Do you like aubergine? Because I don't like aubergine. It's just a personal thing. Now, Mr Brook has told the committee, I would not endorse what he said. I would not use the word bizarre to describe the comments. I would say it was extremely ill-judged to say what he did. I can reassure you on behalf of ITV, we take all of these allegations very seriously, precisely because of we do have a culture where people's conduct matters enormously. Ask if Frizzell's position was secure, he said, that is not a question for me and not a question for now. We'll continue to monitor the committee, of course, and uh, see what is being said. Um, certainly, Caroline McCall, the head of uh, ITV programming, was due before that committee next week. Elsewhere, of course, the COVID-19 inquiry has been holding its preliminary meeting to address ministers' uh, decision to bring forward a judicial review in the ongoing dispute with the government over access to documents and WhatsApp messages uh, concerning the pandemic. Now, that legal challenge likely to be heard, we're told, in late July or shortly afterwards, uh, the counsel to the inquiry uh, said today. Let's get more with our political reporter, Olivia Utley, who joins us from Westminster. Because, Olivia, we weren't quite sure what the status of this inquiry was with this sort of threat of the injunction coming in, which may have stopped it in its tracks. Yeah, we're still not absolutely sure what's going to happen. Jeremy Quinn, the Cabinet Office Minister, was trying to placate Conservative MPs last night who are getting worried that it's all beginning to look like a bit of a cover-up. He said to them that the judicial review is going to be expedited, so it's now going to be at the end of June, and they basically want to get it out of the way as quickly as possible. Although he also said that the government might be willing to mediate over this and they don't want it to get to court, he claims. Of course, the COVID... The, the, uh, the judicial review is a bit defunct now anyway because Boris Johnson has already said that he is going to hand over his WhatsApp messages. But the government has maintained up until this point that they want to fight it anyway on the point of principle because over the next three years there's going to be masses and masses of information, some of which, which the government will call unambiguously irrelevant, which the COVID inquiry is going to ask for. And ministers are worried that if they set the precedent now of handing everything over, then it could be that privacy is compromised in the long run. Now, the opening remarks in the uh, beginning of the inquiry this morning will, will reinforce that worry for ministers. The, there have already been 12 statements requested from sitting and former government ministers and 38 statements requested from various different government bodies. So just the enormous scale of the inquiry and the m amount of information that they're requesting seems to be troubling ministers a bit. But it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this just judicial review when it, happen when it goes ahead at the end of the month. But just to remind people, I mean, Baroness uh, Hallett, who's in charge, uh, she wants to see everything unredacted, i.e. all the details, and, and indicating to the government it is for her to decide what is relevant or otherwise. Yeah, she's being very bolshy about this, and it sounds, to be honest, as though she has a pretty good get case. The government agreed to the terms of the COVID inquiry, which essentially gives Baroness Hallett the scope to uh, request whatever information she likes. She argued this morning that that, that allowance to see whatever she likes is also uh, made in law under the Inquiries Act. So, and there are plenty of eminent judges who've already said that, that uh, the government has a very weak case if it's going to argue that Baroness Hallett can't see all of this information. So it sounds as though the government would probably lose that judicial review if it does go ahead. But as I say, it sounds like that is wavering slightly with Jeremy yeah. Quinn, the Cabinet Office Minister, saying that the government would be willing to mediate. Olivia, at Westminster, for the, uh, the latest, thank you very much for that. And of course, uh, we'll see what emerges, uh, as you say, as we head towards that date later in June. Now, the CBI, Confeder uh, Confederation, if I can say it, of British Industry, one of the biggest business groups in the UK, representing 190,000 companies, is facing a crunch vote by members uh, right now. We think the voting started around 12 noon. It follows a series of allegations against the lobby group, including sexual misconduct. But the new Director General, uh, Ray Newton-Smith, staying positive, saying the meeting is a start of a new chapter, uh, providing an opportunity to address necessary changes to governance and culture at the CBI. The FT takes a slightly different line, 
CBI struggles for support. Head of confidence vote is on its front page. Let's get the latest now with Justin Urquhart Stewart, economist and co founder of Regionally, um, and someone who's followed the CBI one uh, suspects a over time. a long time. <laughs> uh, and boy, have things changed. Well, it may not be the chapter, I suspect it might be a conclusion because CBI always used to represent the large corporations in Britain and uh, the highly respected people who uh, the sort of uh, the, the senior people apparently in the city, um, all amongst the, the golden group who used to run the FTSE 100 companies, yeah. it didn't actually really represent real British business, i.e. where does actually the most of the growth come from, smaller businesses. Yeah. We're very good at setting it, up. It was, it was known, of course, as, as, as the boss's trade union, yeah. if it, you like. It, yeah. it was. And uh, it was a familiar characters there. And a lot of the corporations would send some of those people who are probably due for retirement quite soon as a quite little, yeah, go there for two or three years, that'll see you off quite nicely. Before you get to the golf club. Yeah. Exactly. OK. Uh, but there are lots of different other groups, like the Institute of Directors, Chambers of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, um, and some of which are just there to actually sell things to companies, sort of training products and things like like that, but others which really do represent um, you know, companies to government. Um, and I think one of the areas that's changed radically have been the Chambers of Commerce. Yeah. Used to be the old members of the golf club <laughs> and were running the local wine committee. Now they've changed. There's quite a few of them. Honestly, run, run by uh, some very strong women as well. Really focusing on their local businesses. I think one in Lancashire, Hounslow um, and Staffordshire. Really dynamic. And areas. the key to this is it, it could be a sea change. These are the small and medium companies Companies, the engine room, if you like, of the British economy, who may tell the government exactly what's going on at the coalface. Absolutely. And, and, you know, what inflation is doing, what high interest rates are doing, uh, and the pain that they're feeling. Um, and it's indicating, um, I think, the BCC, British Chambers of Commerce, they want to set up a business council. And they've already got BP and IHG hotels on there, you know, big hitters. Yeah, suddenly they're sort of attracting those sort of ones. Now, I hope in many ways, it's good they do attract them, but that mustn't take away from the, the main driver, which are these small businesses. Now, remember, we set up, in normal times, set up more small businesses or more businesses than France and Germany put together. And we grow them. And we're very entrepreneurial. We're very bad. Quote a French phrase, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get in somewhere. <laughs> but nonetheless, what happens, we're very bad at financing them into growth. And they're right. not southeast based. So if you really want to do levelling up, actually, you go to these tech hubs around the country, like Newcastle, Manchester, all sorts of places, and that's where the growth will be coming from. Give them not money from the government. Don't need that. There's no short of money. Give them the tax breaks to grow. Right. And, and has there been a suspicion that the government has been rather divorced from what is happening on the floor of the engineering tool shop? Uh, the manufacturing yep. floor of these factories and so on and so forth. You know, they, they've spoken to the big business leaders and enterprise councils and so on, but those who are making widgets and, and, and rivets, they're not talking directly to the government. You, you see the usual pictures of the, of, the, of the politicians turning up and they go to those well-known companies, you know, it's Rolls-Royce and nothing wrong with those companies, yeah. but that's not, they're not the driving ones, the ones which are going to give us our future, which are going to, going to get us out of our financial mess. No, no, don't get too depressed. We actually do have some very strong areas in our economy. They need greater focus on it and they need a greater voice. We had a Prime Minister that said something rather rude about business, which is frankly rather childish. Yes. Because government this actually... This is Boris Johnson. Yes. He um, went on to talk about Peppa Pig, I think. Oh, we, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah. right, right, right mess of it. Where, of course, the government doesn't have any money. The government has our money as produced by business. Mm. Um, and so, no, we need to be nurturing these ones and developing them, encouraging them to make more money and not only that, get more investment into this country. OK. And build our reputation. Well, should we, should we hold a requiem for the CBI then? <laughs> Um, what went wrong, apart from, obviously, the, the, what's described as a culture uh, at the heart? I mean, Brian McBride, um, who's now trying to get this vote through, um, it's not a given, a critical vote, but hope there's enough renewal uh, to give confidence to the CBI. Oh, there'll be some compliments, but they lost contact with the primary base. Right. Um, and I think, actually, they're the wrong base anyway. And they haven't kept up to date, no, to really see what's changed. New business is all about technology and development. It's moving very very fast, leaving me way behind, um, and a lot of them even further behind. So you need someone who's right close to the coalface saying, what do these people need right now? What are the breaks we need? How do we employ people in 10 years' time? How does AI affect all of well, us? Well, yeah. 
Um, so, you know, it is, it is a, a, we need people who understand all of that. So old people like me are completely irrelevant to all of this. I was, I, I, I was, I was just wondering further. if you were making a pitch for the job yourself there for a moment. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, been there, seen there, done that. I but, think I get yeah. replaced pretty quickly. Justin, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And of course, we'll see uh, what happens. The uh, vote underway will uh, bring the result as soon as we get that. Also coming up uh, in this next hour here on GB News Live, we'll be back to the High Court. Prince Harry giving this explosive evidence in uh, the case concerning Mirror Group newspapers. We'll have the very latest with uh, Cameron, our royal correspondent, uh, with the Prince indicating about the uh, toll it's taken on him and his responsibilities uh, elsewhere. More in a moment. Hello again, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office with the GB News forecast. Cloudy for many of us today, brightest in the west where sunshine will come through during the afternoon and it will feel warm in that sunshine. But we've seen a bit more cloud spread more widely across the UK through the night and that cloud is going to be persistent in many central and eastern parts with high pressure to the north of the UK and an easterly airflow coming around that high, bringing in low cloud from the North Sea. And that low cloud is going to be persistent across northern and eastern Scotland, much of eastern England, but also across parts of the Midlands into southeast England. So I think disappointingly cloudy for many and feeling cool where we've got that cloud and the breeze from the North Sea. Just 12 degrees, say, on the North Sea coast, but sunshine coming out for the southwest of England, Wales, northwest England, western Scotland and Northern Ireland, feeling warm here. We keep the clear skies in the west overnight, but the cloud elsewhere will tend to thicken. It will creep its way back westwards into East Wales, parts of Devon, Dorset, Somerset, for example, and central Scotland also seeing a thickening of the cloud. Where we've got the cloud, some spots of drizzle possible, but otherwise a generally dry night and staying clear for Northern Ireland, Western Scotland, West Wales and the far southwest of England, a few mist patches in the northwest to start things off on Wednesday. Otherwise, we've got that low cloud once again. I think this time it will retreat back to the coast much more quickly and it will generally just be coastal by the mid-afternoon. One or two showers possibly over the highlands, but otherwise plenty of warm sunshine coming through and it will feel warmer uh, across the south compared with previous days. 24, 25 Celsius will be the warmest day of the year so far. And then it's Wednesday night, well, we do it all again. That low cloud creeps westwards once more from the North Sea and it's going to become fairly extensive by Thursday morning, but it will burn back to the coast and it's going to be another very warm day. In fact, temperatures are rising, high 20s by the weekend. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. Like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GV News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel.
You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. It's one o'clock, a very good afternoon. You're with GB News Live. I'm Mark Longhurst, and coming up for you this Tuesday lunchtime. Harry faces up to the mirror. The Duke of Sussex spending the morning under cross-examination in his hacking case against the newspaper group. Both the press, the government, even former royal butler Paul Burrell coming under fire. In his evidence so far, he said the tabloid press had started him as a blank canvas, but then he was the playboy prince, the failure, the dropout, or in my case, he said, the thicko, the underage drinker, and the irresponsible drug taker. The list goes on, he says. We'll have the latest live from court. The UK promises to help us as Russians are blamed for destroying a Ukrainian dam, flooding cities, towns and villages. The European Council says it clearly qualifies as a war crime. We'll have the latest live from the scene as a huge rescue gets underway. And also coming up, 79 uh, nine years on, rather, since the D-Day landings, we'll hear from one man who landed on the beaches of Normandy on that longest day. First, all the latest headlines with Rory. Thank you very much, Mark. The Duke of Sussex accuses the press of having blood on their hands during his cross-examination at the High Court in London. Prince Harry has given evidence against the publisher of the Daily Mirror over alleged unlawful information gathering. In his witness statement, he says he felt physically sick to learn there were eight payments to private investigators in relation to his mother and 135 separate payments related to him. He says he realises that his acute paranoia of being constantly under surveillance was not misplaced. Mirror Group newspaper denies all allegations. Well, meanwhile, the US government will be challenged in court over its decision to give the Duke of Sussex a visa in 2020. It's after Prince Harry's admission of illegal drug use in his book Spare. It's not known if he admitted this for the visa application. US official policy said that visa applicants who are found to be drug users or addicts are inadmissible. One of ITV's senior management team has told MPs there is a significant system of safeguarding and duty of care at the company. Magnus Broke has been questioned in Parliament over the broadcaster's handling of Philip Schofield's affair with a younger male colleague. He also says bullying is absolutely in breach of his company's code of conduct amid allegations of a toxic work environment. ITV Chief Executive Dame Carla McCall is being called to appear at the committee on June the 14th to answer questions. Downing Street says the government is willing to agree another way forward rather than taking legal action against the COVID inquiry. The inquiry asked the Cabinet Office to return Mr Johnson's notes books to him by June the 12th to compare them to the redacted copies already provided by the Cabinet Office. The inquiry's chairwoman, Baroness Heather Hallett, says she will not be commenting on the legal row due to pending litigation. Well, the counsel for the COVID inquiry, Hugo Keith, says the Cabinet Office is only seeking to ensure that national security protected material was not going to be disclosed by Mr Johnson. Mr Johnson has offered to provide the inquiry with assistance directly. We're grateful to him for his cooperation and the inquiry team has been liaising with his legal team to arrange for the inspection 
of the unredacted WhatsApps that he had provided to the Cabinet Office, but which he has had returned to him. We expect to begin that inspection this week. The Labour leader says the transition to green energy will establish a new business model for Britain. Speaking at the GMB Union's conference, Sir Keir Starmer has rejected the idea of on offshore wind until jobs are secured. It's after GMB General Secretary Gary Smith expressed concerns that the party's stance may lead to a sudden drop in jobs, referring to it as a cliff edge. Sir Keir has also vowed his party would ensure there are more renewable jobs and strengthen society. So I want to be clear. Everything I do... All the changes we're making are in the service of this goal. They are grounded in a new project which understands that the Labour Party can only restore hope in Britain if we once again become the natural home for working people. Thousands of people are being evacuated from their homes after an attack on a two-mile-long dam in southern Ukraine. Russia says it was a terrorist act by Ukraine because its counter-offensive is faltering. But Ukraine blames Moscow for causing the widespread flooding. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, is in Kyiv meeting President Zelensky and says the best thing Russia can do now is withdrawing their troops immediately. The Veterans Memorial Service is taking place to celebrate the 79th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy. The service commemorates the anniversary of Operation Overlord, which marks the momentous 1944 Normandy landings in France. These landings mark the beginning of Allied Forces' mission to liberate mainland Europe from Nazi Germany during World War II. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. Back to Mark. Rory, thanks very much and uh, welcome back to GB News Live. Well, Prince Harry not been pulling his punches this morning as he becomes the first royal to give evidence uh, under cross-examination at court for a hundred years. He is suing Mirror Group newspapers over allegations of uh, phone hacking and uh, illegal information gathering, claiming that Piers Morgan's conduct, the former editor, of course, in the final months of his mother Diana's life made him physically sick. He said former royal butler Paul Burrell was, and I apologise for the language, a two-faced SH1T. Both the press and the government, he said, were at rock bottom. Uh, well, in the past few minutes, Mirror Group newspaper's KC, the barrister, uh, Andrew Green, not pulling his punches, turning up the heat indeed, saying, uh, that's not an answer. The barrister sharply replying to one ply and then uh, accusing the prince of being in the realms of total speculation. Uh, so, let's get more with our Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker, who's been following uh, this case. He's outside the court. And Cameron, of course, just to indicate this is where it may become difficult for the Prince, having set out his witness statement, now this KC is starting to forensically probe his evidence. Absolutely, Mark. And forensically probing his evidence is a very good description because I don't think Mr Andrew Green, KC, representing Mirror Group newspapers, ever had the heat turned down. He started uh, cross-examining Prince Harry at 10.30 this morning and he is forensically going through every single detail of Prince Harry's witness statement and the points in which he believes um, information written about him was unlawfully uh, obtained from Mirror Group newspaper uh, Journalists. So, concluding Prince Harry's witness statement, he says, in my view, in order to save journalism as a profession, journalists need to expose those people in the media that have stolen or hijacked the privileges and powers of the press and have used illegal or unlawful means for their own gain and agendas. Well, what's happened this morning is that uh, Andrew Green Casey, representing Mirror Group newspapers, he has been going through the 33 articles which are being tested in this case. The first dates to 1996, which Prince Harry alleges 
uh, was uh, the information was obtained through unlawful information gathering, specifically phone hacking. And Andrew Green KC makes the point that he didn't have a mobile phone until two years after this article was written. Well, Prince Harry responded to that by saying that his security team had a landline in a private room in Lovegrove School, Princess, and that perhaps uh, the phone of his mother, Princess Diana, was hacked uh, instead. But I think I'm just going to pick out the latest uh, article which the uh, which the barrister representing Mirror Group newspapers has forensically gone through. And it was written in 2002. And this is uh, the story that he shared a joint, Prince Harry shared a joint with his friends and also talking about Prince Charles's, now of course King's, response to Prince Harry smoking cannabis. Now, uh, Mr. Andrew Green said your complaint is that allegations of you smoked cannabis and your father's reaction that Prince Charles gave you a stern warning and that he understood you wanted to enjoy your teenage years. And he asked Prince Harry, do you say that that information was obtained through phone hacking. Harry said unlawful information gathering. I'm not sure how the two are separated. Well, the Mirror Group newspaper's barrister pointed out that it was the news of the world, the now defunct news of the world, that actually broke that story. Uh, and similar de and it's very similar details to what the Mirror wrote up at a later date. And of course, let's remember, it's the Mirror Group newspapers who Prince Harry is suing in the court uh, behind us. And Prince Harry was saying that the article was making assumptions. The Mirror Group newspaper's barrister, Mr Green, also pointed out that in that story, the Buckingham Palace, or at least uh, Prince Charles's former spin doctor, Mark Bolland, cooperated with the News of the World in order to write that story. Prince Harry said that was one particular individual working at the palace rather than the institution as a whole. But he then quoted, this is the barrister, quoted from Prince Harry's memoir Spare, using it against him about how Rebecca Brooks, former editor of News of the World, uh, wrote that story and essentially got to the point that uh, was putting it to Prince Harry that it wasn't the Mirror um, unlawfully obtaining information in order to write that story. They just took their information from uh, the News of the World, who, which had written an article about this at a previous date. Well, Prince Harry made the point that in newsrooms, journalists, particularly uh, royal journalists at this time period, were desperately trying to get exclusive and, exclusives and were under intense pressure from editors uh, in order to move the story on and move it forward and get, a, get an exclusive line for their individual newspaper. He also made the point that the journalist in question had actually was known uh, in, in previous articles for using uh, private investigators who had obtained information through unlawful means. Well, Mr Green uh, put it to Prince Harry that that is just, as you said in your introduction, Mark, just speculation. Well, I think we have just broken for lunch in this case. The uh, KC, Mr Andrew Green, representing Mirror Group newspapers, is expected to cross-examine Prince Harry for at least a day and a half. We're only four or five articles in of the 33, and we're already half a day up, so I'm not quite sure how, if it might, it might well go on longer than a day and a half. But to summarise, it appears that the KC representing Mirror Group newspapers is incredibly across the detail and it appears from being in the courtroom and listening to Prince Harry's testimony uh, that Prince Harry's detail at the moment is lacking. However, he is very much responding and defending his case, uh, particularly when it comes to the use of burner phones in this time period when it came to phone hacking and the fact that the evidence from those burner phones that are, is no longer available to use. So it is a lot of suspicion and a lot of uh, talking about what the journalists had done historically who had written these articles, which he is now complaining about in court. Yeah, as, as you say, uh, a break now for a, an hour for lunch, two and a half hours of evidence so far. But I think the judge was indicating um, to uh, the Mirror Group newspaper's um, uh, legal team that he would give them as long as they needed to cross-examine because obviously Prince Harry hadn't turned up for that first day on the Monday. 
Yes, so the judge, Mr Justice Fancourt, said yesterday he was surprised that Prince Harry was not here for day one of his case against Mirror Group newspapers. He had actually said in a previous uh, preliminary hearing for this case that he expected witnesses to be available the day before uh, they were due to give evidence in case the opening statements ran short. And the fact that Prince Harry is now here this morning and it has taken two and a half hours to get through five of the 33 cases, I think perhaps suggests to me that it is going to take longer than a day and a half uh, to go through all these uh, articles that were written between 1996 and 2010, particularly because Mr Andrew Green has been going through this in such minute detail and is really questioning uh, all of Prince Harry's witness statement, which clearly could take some time. And remember, Prince Harry is one of, I think, four other uh, yeah, high-profile yeah. individuals who are being used uh, as part of these proceedings for a, a wide litigation against Mirror Group newspapers and the trial, the whole trial itself is expected to last six or seven weeks. So clearly there is a lot of time to play with here for uh, the defence of, of Mirror Group newspapers. Cameron, thank you for that. More reaction in a moment. Let's just bring you some breaking news to tell you that Margaret Ferrier, uh, who's the uh, independent MP for Rutherglen and Hamilton uh, West in Scotland, suspended from the House of Commons for 30 days for breaching those uh, coronavirus uh, rules. Of course, she'd uh, taken that train uh, back north from uh, um, the Commons to Glasgow uh, to avoid self-isolating in London. Um, now, she'd already been ordered to complete a 270-hour community payback order by court after admitting uh, recklessly exposing the public to the risk of infection. Now, the issue about that 30-day suspension is it will almost certainly lead to a by-election in Rutherglen and Hamilton West. She'd won the seat for the SNP uh, back in 2019 with a majority of 5,230, but had been sitting as an independent since losing the SNP whip uh, over this. So this will be the first electoral test for the new SNP leader, Humsa Yousaf. Labour, of course, hopeful that they may be able to gain that seat back from the SNP. So uh, politics there north of the border, um, getting some uh, changes, perhaps. And uh, she, uh, of course, uh, had been speaking in Parliament while awaiting uh, the results of those tests, uh, then learning she had tested positive. Reaction to that as it comes in. But let's return now to uh, Harry at the High Court and uh, speak to Royal Commentator Richard Fitzwilliams, uh, who, like everyone else, has been following these uh, events this morning. Uh, Richard, it, it's been um, pretty dramatic stuff, and I, I guess indicates... Um, that maxim of never complain or explain has just gone out the window as far as Prince Harry is concerned. Oh, absolutely. I think that uh, his refusal to accept uh, a settlement without an appearance, I mean, this is what he wanted, because he sees himself as a champion of those who have been, and he believes his whole life has been blighted, as we saw in that uh, extraordinary witness statement, uh, by press intrusion. Uh, he using phrases like vile and talking about the way the mental health had been affected and various examples that was very, very clearly he is extraordinarily angry and passionate. But there's absolutely no doubt that it's going to be fascinating and indeed uh, a duel between someone who is a very experienced investigator and someone who is extraordinarily well, I'm used to this because as a member of the royal family in all the interviews that he's given so far and looking back to him and Meghan on Oprah. I mean, they didn't probe at all. Quite the contrary. This yeah. is very, very different. Uh, it's interesting, of course, that we've got a, a KC who is trying to establish whether there is direct evidence rather than the suspicions. But, of course, it is the judge deciding on the balance of probability rather than the jury deciding on, you know, the, the facts being proved. So uh, there's an interesting dynamic at play here. And it's also interesting that Harry's made these more general comments rather than the specifics uh, about the power of the press claiming the police and the government were scared to hold them accountable. Yes, this is where we see a battleground shaping up between, on the one hand, Harry saying uh, a certain piece of evidence or something would never have happened without there being hacking, and then Green's response 
prove it. And then Harry could say and will say and has said, uh, what about the journalists who wrote it? Why aren't they in court? So uh, this battle is going to be, fa it will be absolutely fascinating, but whether this business of the balance of probability, the facts are you need proof clearly, uh, proof to satisfy the judge that phone hacking, which of course occurred in certain instances uh, with the Mirror Group and they paid out, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has happened in the specific ones which Harry has mentioned. So outrage is one thing, proof obviously is another. Yeah, and, and where uh, you know the allegation of the MGN uh, staff or, or uh, private detectives working on their behalf were directly uh, using these um, uh, illegal means of gathering information, or whether they were gathering it by contacts and other newspapers and so on. But I, I just wonder what this might do for the public perception too of Prince Harry, in that we're getting a fuller picture of what it's done to him over the years with this constant press intrusion and attention. Yes, absolutely. And I think the witness statement, and when that, for example, comes out in the papers more, because it was huge and yeah, people yeah. haven't really time to digest it. And I think there will be a lot of sympathy because when he was very young, his mother, the way she was affected, and we know how tragically she died, also his relationship with Chelsea Davy and the fact that his whole life he sees himself as being persecuted. And the facts are that there's no question that the phone hacking issue was one of the deepest shame for the British press. To what extent it could be proven that these specific 33 articles were as a result of it, that will be, of course, the, whether or not he wins the case. But there will be sympathy for a lot of what he says, especially with those who have young, uh, long memories, and very possibly be very interesting to see how young people respond to the yeah. way he feels he's been treated. Yeah, and, and his relationship with Chelsea Davy, for instance, having just seen the, the photograph of them uh, together then in earlier days. Richard, for the moment, thank you for that. As we say, the court has risen for lunch. Uh, resume at two o'clock. We'll bring you all the evidence as uh, it is brought before the court later on. Also coming up, the UK will offer further help to Ukraine after that huge dam in the south of the country was destroyed. Uh, an enormous rescue and recovery operation underway at the moment. We'll have the latest for you shortly. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion. Looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. And welcome back to GB News Live. The UK has announced it's to offer further help to Ukraine after that huge dam in the south of the country was destroyed. Major evacuations now underway. Uh, the Ukrainian authorities blaming the Russians for the explosion. The European Council saying it clearly qualifies, in their view, as a war crime. Well, cities, towns and villages in the region now facing significant flooding uh, with mass evacuations underway. Ukraine's foreign ministry calling for an urgent meeting of the UK, uh, UN Security Council Council, claiming the attack the result of a Russian terrorist incident. The Kremlin should face new international sanctions, they say. And in terms of uh, the situation on the ground, President Zelensky's office saying the Dnipro River, uh, which flows from the dam, uh, now contaminated with some 150 tonnes of industrial lubricants. The river itself, of course, providing, uh, and the reservoir, much of the drinking water for Crimea. Well, let's get more now with former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram, uh, who can join us. Uh, and Philip, just to reiterate what uh, Europe's stance is on this, they see this as civilian infrastructure, no military uh, connection at all with this dam being attacked. It is, but it's interesting. You know, the Russians are blaming the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are blaming the Russians. And I've just read a report from someone who's a structural engineer saying that there could have been damage that um, started last year where there had been Ukrainian shelling at the end of October, early November, and then the Russians blew up the road um, going over the top of the dam in November. Uh, and then there's been fluctuating water levels on the other side of it where it's been badly managed and could have exacerbated any structural defects that were put in there. So yeah. you know, we, we, I don't think, are completely clear as to who's behind it or whether it was that uh, had been caused by previous damage. However, well, let, let's just reflect on the pictures that we've got, uh, these uh, pictures showing what does uh, seem to be a huge explosion. The, the picture goes white. We can then see a mushroom cloud. I mean, that appears not to be a rupture, but an explosion of some kind. And one wonders why the Ukrainians themselves would try and blow up their own dam, knowing what damage it would do downstream. Oh, exactly. And, and this is this is where, uh, you know, if and I hadn't seen those pictures, um, you know, the, the Russians have got more to gain from it. What is it interesting that um, they haven't withdrawn their forces that are in the floodplain um, that are in, in defended positions. So they may have lost a lot of equipment um, as they try to get their forces out in, in, in doing that. So maybe they hadn't expected uh, what's happened. But from a Russian perspective, what it's doing is it's protecting a large part of the front line from any... Um, Ukrainian incursions across. And the Ukrainians for the last few months have been sending small boat incursions of special forces across the Dnipro down in the Kherson area to try and um, operate in the uh, the rear areas of the Russian defences that are there. This yeah. uh, incident will have stopped them from doing that and therefore allow the Russians to concentrate on a smaller area of front line that they could be the Ukrainian counteroffensive on. Not that the Ukrainians would ever have been able to get a, a major military force across what is a significant obstacle. Well, in, indeed, I was going to say it is like a military front line, isn't it, trying to, to breach uh, such an enormous river. Uh, and one wonders whether there was that uh, in the Russian mindset in terms of um, uh, setting this off. But uh, I guess the other aspect, as we saw back in the Dam Busters raid, of course, in the Second World War, it ties up all sorts of other resources in dealing with the aftermath. Oh, very much so. Um, and, and, and dealing with immediate implications, you know, the, the biggest worry is... Um, you know the uh, uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant 
um, and making sure that the cooling water can go into there. Most of the reactors, I understand, have been shut down, but they still yeah. require um, additional cooling water to come in and, and, and stop them getting into a dangerous position. Uh, I'm sure there will be backups in place for that, and uh, it'll be some time before the water levels drop to a point where um, it, it could affect that. But then from a longer-term perspective, um, it provides all of the fresh water supplies into Crimea. That's yeah. going to cause the Russians real logistical difficulties in the future and could indicate the fact that the Russians have recognised that uh, if the Ukrainians do punch through, then uh, the Russians' ability to uh, hold on to and to maintain Crimea is uh, in jeopardy. And the Russians are starting um, an element of a scorched earth policy as they recognise that they're probably going to get pushed back. Yeah, I think President Zelensky's office saying some 80 towns and villages at the moment thought to be affected as, as the water levels rise. But also, in addition, uh, bearing in mind what you said about water supplies, 150 tonnes of industrial lubricants uh, now contaminating the river, which is going to be significant. So uh, I guess you know they've got this parallel thing of looking after the civilian population and trying to work out what the military consequences are as well. Well, and the environmental consequences, and you know, the yeah. one the one thing that there is with the whole of the conflict in uh, Ukraine is the environmental consequences are huge. Um, and you know, as the Dnieper flows out into uh, the Black Sea, you know, that's not just going to affect the coastline around Ukraine. Um, it's going to affect um, some very um, delicate infrastructure that there is. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, natural infrastructure within uh, and natural environments within within the Black Sea. And that's one of the big dangers that there is with the conflict. Um, and from the Russian perspective, it, it will allow them, now that they've got effectively a secure um, boundary that the Ukrainians are not going to get across, it'll allow them to take a number of the troops that were protecting that and move them up to uh, other areas to provide a, a sort of reserve capability yeah. um, to counter any Ukrainian counteroffensive. So you know, it's, it's a difficult time for all, I think, at the moment. Yeah, and uh, from, from the sort of wider picture, let's just bring in some pictures we've also received. Uh, we were talking about this huge operation underway uh, to rescue people, but we've got these pictures as well uh, coming in of uh, efforts to save a dog that was in danger uh, of drowning as the, the waters were rising uh, further downstream. Uh, this uh, just coming in, uh, I think, from social media uh, there in uh, in ukraine uh, but those dogs successfully saved so uh, at least part of that rescue operation has succeeded uh, obviously uh, not quite uh, the situation that uh, the uh, ukrainians will be wanting to reflect on in terms of the the human lives that are at risk but certainly uh, an indication of what's happening on the ground but uh, philip thank you for your time we'll see what emerges in these coming hours of course thank you very much indeed thank you Still to come, uh, 79 years on since D-Day. Remembering that longest day was someone who was actually there. Let's get an update now on the news headlines with Rory. Thank you very much, Mark. Prince Harry accuses the British government of being at rock bottom. The Duke of Sussex is giving evidence in London against the publisher of the Daily Mirror over alleged unlawful information gathering. He said, Our country is judged globally by the state of our press and our government, both of which, he says, are at rock bottom. He also accuses the press of having blood on their hands during his cross-examination at the High Court. Mirror Group newspaper denies all allegations. One of ITV's senior management team has told MPs there's a significant system of safeguarding and duty of care at the company. Magnus Broke has been questioned in Parliament over the broadcaster's handling of Philip Schofield's affair with a younger male colleague. ITV chief executive Dame Caroline McCall is being called to appear at the committee on June the 14th to answer questions. Downing Street says the government is willing to agree another way forward rather than taking legal action against the COVID inquiry. The inquiry asked the Cabinet Office to return Boris Johnson's notebooks to him by June the 12th to compare them to the redacted copies already provided by the Cabinet Office. The inquiry's chairwoman, Baroness Heather Hallett, says she will not be commenting on the legal row due to pending litigation. As you've been hearing from Mark, thousands of people are being evacuated from their homes after an attack on a two-mile-long dam in southern Ukraine. 
Russia says it was a terrorist act by Ukraine because its counter-offensive is faltering. But Ukraine blames Moscow for causing the widespread flooding. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly is in Kyiv meeting President Zelensky and says the best thing Russia can do now is to withdraw their troops immediately. That's you up to date, but you can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website. That's gbnews.com. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. All right, let's take a look at today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2403 and €1.1615. Euros. The price of gold, that's sitting at £1,584.24 per ounce. And the FTSE 100, that's at 7000 Five hundred and eighty-seven points. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, today marks 79 years since one of the most significant events of World War II. D-Day, Operation Overlord, often recognised as having played the crucial role in the Allies starting to defeat Germany. So important that we mark this day every year in recognition of those who gave their lives for our freedom. Well, our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper has been speaking to a D-Day veteran who landed on those beaches of Normandy that day back in 1944. Under the air cover, the great fleet of little ships marched on. 79 years ago came the beginning to the end of World War II. 
So great was the speed of this advance that the retreating Germans were never given the chance to get organised. On the 6th of June 1944, what's now known as D-Day took place. Tens of thousands of Allied troops invaded the beaches of Normandy by land, air and sea. Just one of those was Bernard Morgan. The thing I remember mostly, and I should never forget, is seeing our troops digging the dead bodies out of the sand on the Normandy beaches. Bernard enlisted on his 18th birthday, determined to play his part. He was trained up as a code breaker, and on D-Day, he was the youngest RAF sergeant to land in Normandy. We were anchored seven miles off the uh, coast on the, on the night before D-Day. Our battleships were behind us. They were firing at the Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall were firing back, and I had to man a Bren gun for two hours on the deck of this landing ship tank. And uh, I tell the truth, I was very frightened. As a trained codebreaker, Bernard had access to a telex, a device used during World War II to communicate electronically. As a result, he knew that the war was coming to an end two days before VE Day. We couldn't believe it when we got this message to say the war would finish in two days' time. Nobody to be advised at all. It gave us a great thrill to think that we'd be playing a part in it and our little bit had helped to bring it to an end. Now, almost eight decades later, and Bernard still works regularly with the Royal British Legion to remember his fallen comrades. I always think of the poor lads who gave their lives for the freedom that we enjoy today. Sailors, soldiers, airmen and civilians who gave their lives so that we could live a free life. They're the ones who are, I call the heroes. Flower Deck Memorials speak of the gratitude of a whole people. To the world will, of course, always remember D-Day, a day that made all the difference in winning the Second World War. Sophie Reaper, GB News. Remembering that longest day and, of course, uh, those on the beaches of Normandy on that day, 1944. Now, the latest uh, in the ITV soap opera, drama, whatever you want to call it, well, MP John Nicholson, who's on the Culture and Media Committee, uh, has said that comments by Martin Frizzell, the editor of This Morning, to a journalist, are outrageously dismissive and flippant. Uh, they were on camera about an immensely serious issue. At the committee hearing, Magnus Brook, who's the Group Director of Strategy, Policy and Regulation at ITV, was questioned about uh, Mr Frizzell's comments. Our national reporter Paul Hawkins joins us now from outside Port Cullis House. Uh, and Paul... Um, in terms of uh, the assessment of what Mr Frizzell said, or the way he said it, um, clearly this senior manager is not impressed. No, absolutely not. He called Martin Frizzell's comments uh, ill-judged. Just to put into context this session, it was essentially a session with three media executives, one from Channel 4, one from Paramount and one from ITV. It was actually to talk about this uh, media bill, this piece of legislation that is making its way through the continent. It's just part of the standard scrutiny, scrutinisation process that the uh, DCMS committee uh, regularly undertake on uh, new laws. But they but, the, but during this scrutinisation of the bill, uh, Magnus Brook, who is, as you say, the Group Director of Strategy, Policy and Regulation at ITV, was asked uh, about Martin Frizzell's comments. He described them uh, as ill-judged, uh, so clearly unhappy with Martin Frizzell's behaviour yesterday. He was also asked about ITV's duty of care to its staff, particularly uh, those younger members of staff, and uh, this is what he, what he had to say. This is the exchange between the SNP MP, John Nicholson, uh, and Magnus Brook. Are you satisfied with the duty of care that the editorial team and senior managers provide to staff, especially young staff working there and at ITV more generally? Um, 
Mr. Lucas, I mean, I think there's a there's a uh, a very sophisticated uh, and a significant system of safeguarding uh, and duty of care at ITV, uh, with a very significant uh, set of policies. Um, uh, we have a, a, a code of conduct uh, which sets out our expectations about how people behave, uh, and that deals with a, a number of different issues from equal opportunities to respect at work, dignity, uh, and understanding. And then we we then have an important set of of uh, requirements uh, which hold people to account internally. Why are so many of the staff so unhappy, uh, former and current staff? And of course, Paul, there'll, there'll be more to come next week. But just on this specific about the editor, um, it's interesting to look at what is being quoted when he was uh, questioned by this Sky News reporter. Martin Frizzell saying, I'll tell you what's toxic, and I've always found it toxic, aubergine. Do you like aubergine? Do you? Do you like aubergine? Because I don't like aubergine. It's just a personal thing. Uh, Mr Brooke going on to say, I wouldn't endorse what he said. Yeah, clearly unhappy with the, the, the flippant way with which Martin Frizzell viewed the reporter's completely legitimate questions. So, didn't reflect very well on the company, and ITV would like to think that Magnus Brook has drawn a line under it. You say, uh, talk, or rather you point, Mark, to next yeah. week, that's the 14th of June. That's when we get a proper dedicated questioning session by that group of MPs to the chief executive of ITV. That's Dame Carolyn uh, McCall. Now, Carolyn Dinanidge, the uh, chair of the committee, has said uh, that the grilling will not be a witch hunt. She said it's about misuse of power, and in the public interest, it'll focus on uh, work, culture and processes and how ITV intends to move forward with safeguarding procedures and learn lessons from, from the incident. The interesting thing will be to find out who knew what in management, did they know anything and it, if they did know anything, what did they know and when and did they try yeah. to cover it up and will it tally with what Philip Schofield gave in uh, those interviews last week and then of course will that tally with the independent review that ITV have commissioned uh, by an independent lawyer and that's still to come. Yeah, a KC, no less, of course. Uh, well, Paul, for the moment, uh, outside uh, Port Cullis House there in Westminster, thank you for updating us. More as we get it. Uh, as indeed we will in terms of Prince Harry's day in court, of course, uh, unearthing a host of revelations and claims about what the Duke sees as unlawful press intrusion into his life and those of his friends too. The Duke hitting out at uh, journalists whose articles formed the basis of his complaint and who were not appearing in court, he reflected. Well, he told the court their cowardice speaks volumes. I don't understand how they are allowed to hide. Well, joining us now is royal commentator uh, Michael Cole and, of course, former royal correspondent who's uh, followed uh, the princes on, on many of uh, their outings. Um, just to look at the bigger picture, Michael, I mean, it is interesting that we've, we've got, in terms of the witness statement, an indication about just deeply personal and how, how damaging the prince thinks this has been to him over the years. Yeah. D-Day for the prince of litigation. Uh, in the past, he has said that the British tabloid press is the mothership of online trolling, and he said that he wants to save the British press. The question is, can he save himself? Mm. I've been reading through the evidence, and you've been reporting it brilliantly, uh, and it's not going very well for him, because his hurt is evident, his complaints are manifold, uh, he's very, very concerned as what happened to his friends and what happened to himself. And his but mother, of course. And his mother. Yeah. And he's accused blood on their hands and so on. But I'm afraid hurt isn't evidence. This is going to turn on evidence. And the King's Counsel for the Mirror Group newspapers, Andrew Green, has been taking him through painstakingly one by one. There are 33 instances of alleged illicit uh, news gathering. He's been taking him through yeah. them, and, and on each occasion, he's been pointing out to the prince that a lot of these stories, which he complains have been gathered illicitly, have either appeared in other newspapers beforehand. So we're or, in the public domain already. Well, yeah. in the public yeah. domain, or indeed, on one occasion, were briefed by his father's uh, chief of press uh, relations, Mark Boland. Mm. Uh, so what he's demonstrating to the prince, and the prince is not 
having it, of course. He's saying, these, these are my suspicions. Right. Now, this, this is the KC in, in question, Andrew Green, uh, who has uh, been described as fearless and fearsome, a cross-examiner of uncompromising and relentless uh, expertise. Called so, the beast. The beast, indeed. <laughs> now, given that, let's just explain to people that, of course, Press intrusion as such is not illegal. No. Uh, and you know that, obviously, as a member of the royal family, that's part and parcel of the game. However, it's trying to prove this illegal element, which phone hacking is, mm -hmm. and other measures are as yes. well. Flagging. We haven't heard anything too specific about that so far in court. No. He is finding it very difficult. Well, he's certainly bringing no, no evidence th that any of this happened. He has his suspicions. Uh, maybe those suspicions are well-founded. We don't know. But he's got to try and convince the judge, because there's no jury, mm. that this went on. And the judge will be very evidence-based. He's got to prove it, uh, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but on the balance of, of probabilities. And the judge is going to bring in uh, that, that, that thing. Look, you know, uh, Prince Harry was actually born 200 yards, as the London pigeon flies, yeah. away from here, at the Lindo Wing, of Queen Mary's Hospital here, uh, St Mary's Hospital. And I saw him throughout his whole life as a child, uh, ve very anti the media, mm. sticking his tongue out to the dismay of Princess Diana because she knew that picture will get in the paper, mm. throwing stones at, at photographers. It's not an exaggeration to say he hates the press, but hatred is not a good guide yeah. when you're going to law. I, I guess that the, the, the thing that will be tested is his assertion that there are things that the papers picked up that they could not have known unless they were in these various phone conversations or private conversations. Mm -hmm. Because the, the damage, of course, that it did, that relationships, friends broke up thinking, did they talk to the press? Mm. And one does reflect, as you know, as a royal mm. correspondent, yes, people do talk to reporters. They do. They do, and indeed his mother did uh, from time to time when it suited her. Photographers were told to be in a certain position at a certain time. Let's not and, make. Uh, any... She had a very close yeah. relationship with Richard Kay of the Daily Mail, and would ring him up and, and talk to other people. On occasions, she can. She rang me <laughs> on occasions. Listen, um, if he can prove it, this is the thing you've identified it. If he can prove it, that we've got a long way to go, and it's going to be a very arduous time for him. I mean, it's going to be in a, its own way, more testing and more arduous than sitting in the front seat of an Apache helicopter, because this is not a comfortable thing to be cross-examined in a High Court case. Do you feel sorry for him? Well, I certainly have got sympathy. Mm. I've got sympathy for him. I, I was hacked myself by the news of the world. Uh, I, I, I settled concerning that. Concerning other matters, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Concerning other matters. Yeah. I was invited to take action against Mirror Group newspapers. Were you? Yes, but I didn't want to, because actually I believe in a free press, and right. I didn't want to join that action. There was another joint action. I decided not to do it, because I actually do believe in a free press. It's interesting. However, let, let's just reflect that as a broadcast journalist and, yeah. and you're working for the BBC, there are certain things that you, you don't cross the Rubicon, you know, no, you, you, you certainly you don't. do the job properly. You certainly don't. You do it within the law mm. at all times. And that's quite right. And you don't have to indulge in these things. All you have to do is have a good Mark I eyeball, a couple of them preferably, and good ears. You listen, the stories come thick and fast. Yeah. You know, nobody ever uh, had to persuade any member of the royal family to do anything silly or scandalous to get into the newspaper. They're quite capable it... of doing that by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, thank you for that. Uh, they're still at lunch for another ten minutes, but, of course, court will resume and we'll see what comes up uh, in evidence later. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's just update you um, with the situation um, as regards Bournemouth uh, and Bournemouth Pier. You remember, of course, that um, Joe Abbas, who was 17, and um, Suna Khan, who was 12, both died after that incident uh, off the pier last Wednesday. We're now being told all boat operations from Bournemouth Pier have been suspended as a precaution. Uh, you will remember that an inquest had heard a suggestion uh, had... Um, that the pair drowned after a riptide was seen off the pier, but the council has announced that the ban on boat operations will remain 
pending the outcome of the continuing police investigation. Uh, Dorset police saying they're still keeping an open mind, uh, but considering many causes, including the impact of weather conditions, the state of the water, and, of course, there was uh, another boat, the Dorset Bell, a sightseeing boat, which had been impounded by police. But they're going on to say that is just one of several lines of inquiry that are continuing. So we'll have uh, more on that, of course, as it comes through from Dorset police. Now, the COVID-19 inquiry holding a preliminary meeting to address ministers' decisions uh, to bring forward that judicial review in their dispute with the government over access to documents and WhatsApp messages from the pandemic. The committee chair saying she will not be commenting on the legal row with the Cabinet Office, but the counsel to the inquiry said that the legal challenge is likely to be heard on the 30th of June or shortly afterwards. Well, Baroness uh, Heather Hallett chairing the session, attempting to examine the UK's uh, political and administrative decision-making after the Cabinet Office had failed to meet the deadline for providing those messages from the lockdown period. Uh, where are we? Well, let's speak to our political reporter, Olivia Utley, um, who's joining us from Westminster, because, Olivia, we were just trying to work out whether this legal injunction met the process was going to be halted in its tracks, but we're still thinking maybe things will, will carry on for the, the interim. It does sound at the moment as though the Cabinet Office is going to press ahead and bring this to judicial review. Jeremy Quinn, the Cabinet Office Minister, told MPs last night that the judicial review would be expedited and will now be at the end of June. It sounds as though Conservative MPs are getting a bit jittery about the idea of this dragging on and on because they're worried that, in the eyes of the public, it looks a bit like a cover-up. Now, what the Cabinet Office has claimed from the beginning is that uh, the reason why they're so reluctant to hand over these WhatsApps in unredacted form isn't because there's something embarrassing about a sitting cabinet on minister on there that uh, someone doesn't want to be seen. It's that there is a precedent problem. If they set the precedent for Baroness Hallett being allowed to look over whatever material she likes, then in the course of the three-year COVID inquiry, all sorts of uh, private conversations will get exposed to the public. That is apparently the cabinet officers' worry. That's what they claim is their worry anyway. And actually, the opening statements today, you could understand where they were coming from, that the opening statements just showed how broad an inquiry this is going to be. Uh, the, the inquiry has asked for 38 statements from various different government departments, uh, NGOs, arms length bodies, etc. And 12 statements from sitting or former government ministers, uh, the, first, the former uh, First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, Mark Drakeford, First Minister of Wales. So this is a, a really, really broad inquiry. They're asking for a lot of information. Cabinet Office claims that they don't want to pass it over because of this worry about privacy. But Baroness Hallett was sounding very bolshy this morning. She says that she has the right to see all of the information and to decide for herself what's relevant under the terms both of the investigation, which was agreed by the government, and the terms of the Inquiries Act. So if this does go to judicial review, it sounds quite likely that the government will lose. But I think it is just possible that between now and the 30th of June, the government backs down. OK, but do we know if the Baroness has a, uh, a weight of material? Because, of course, Boris Johnson's team was saying they were handing their material directly to the inquiry. Well, exactly. So, you know, there is, a, there is a strong argument that the government will back down simply because it is pointless for them to continue yeah, with yeah. this judicial review. They were arguing that they didn't want to hand over these WhatsApp messages. Boris Johnson has handed them over directly. Now, as things stand, she only has the material from May 2021 onwards because pre-May uh, 2021, Boris Johnson was using a phone which was the subject of a security leak and that phone has been switched off and he was told never to switch it on by the security services. But Boris Johnson has asked the security services if they can find a way to set, turn on that phone securely and it sounds as though they probably will so it sounds as though Baroness Hallett is going to get all of that information anyway the the, the sheer volume of the uh, text messages that the, the documents which she is going to be looking at and her uh, inquiry board is going to be looking at over the next few years just so it shows what an enormous operation this is and I don't think anyone waiting with bated breath to see <laughs> the results of the COVID inquiry is going to have to wait yeah. a bit longer indeed well, a whole your breath till 2026 maybe. Olivia, thank you very much indeed for that uh, at Westminster. Uh, coming up, the thicko, the underage drinker and the irresponsible drug taker. How Harry says the tabloid press saw him the latest from his High Court hearing. Coming up in a moment.
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay, believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. It's two o'clock, a very good afternoon. You're with GB News Live. I'm Mark Longhurst, and coming up this Tuesday afternoon, a royal cross-examination in court, the first time in more than 100 years, in his hacking case against Mirror uh, Group newspapers, Prince Harry attacking politicians, butlers, and, yes, journalists, saying stories questioning his parentage were written to try and oust him from the royal family. In his evidence so far, he said Piers Morgan's coverage of his mother Diana made him physically sick. He feared that revelations in the press would get him expelled from Eton, but under cross-examination, he's not provided any specific evidence of phone hacking. We'll have the latest live from court. Is this explosion a war crime? The UK promises more aid after the Russians are blamed for bombing a dam in Ukraine. Mass evacuation is still underway as cities, towns and villages are flooded. And also coming up, 79 years on since the D-Day landings, we'll hear from a man who landed on the beaches of Normandy on that longest day. First, the latest news headlines with Rory. Thank you very much, Mark. Prince Harry accuses the British government of being at rock bottom. The Duke of Sussex is giving evidence in London against the publisher of the Daily Mirror over alleged unlawful information gathering. He said, Our country is judged globally by the state of our press and our government, both of which, he says, are at rock bottom. He also accuses the press of having blood on their hands during his cross-examination at the High Court. Mirror Group newspapers denies all allegations. 
But meanwhile, the US government will be challenged in court over its decision to give the Duke of Sussex a visa in 2020. It's after Prince Harry's admission of illegal drug use in his book, Spare. It's not known if he admitted this for the visa application. US official policies say that visa applicants who are found to be drug users or addicts are inadmissible. One of ITV's senior management team has defended the company's duty of care, telling MPs there's a significant system of safeguarding in place. Magnus Broke has been questioned in Parliament over the broadcaster's handling of Philip Schofield's affair with a younger male colleague. He also says bullying is absolutely in breach of his company's code of conduct amid allegations of a toxic work environment. ITV Chief Executive Dame Caroline McCall is being called to appear at the committee on June the 14th to answer questions. Downing Street says the government is willing to agree another way forward rather than taking legal action against the Covid inquiry. The inquiry asked the Cabinet Office to return Boris Johnson's notebooks to him by June the 12th to compare them to the redacted copies already provided by the Cabinet Office. The inquiry's chairwoman, Baroness Heather Hallett, says she will not be commenting on the legal row due to pending litigation. The counsel for the COVID inquiry, Hugo Keith, says the Cabinet Office is only seeking to ensure that national security protected material was not going to be disclosed by Mr Johnson. Mr Johnson has offered to provide the inquiry with assistance directly. We're grateful to him for his cooperation and the inquiry team has been liaising with his legal team to arrange for the inspection of the unredacted WhatsApps that he had provided to the Cabinet Office, but which he has had returned to him. We expect to begin that inspection this week. Thousands of people are being evacuated from their homes after an attack on a two-mile-long dam in southern Ukraine. Russia says it was a terrorist act by Ukraine because its counter-offensive is faltering. But Ukraine blames Moscow for causing the widespread flooding. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, is in Kyiv meeting President Zelensky and says the best thing Russia can do now is to withdraw their troops immediately. The Labour leader says the transition to green energy will establish a new business model for Britain. Speaking at the GMB Union's conference, Sir Keir Starmer has rejected the idea of offshore wind until jobs are secured. It's after GMB General Secretary Gary Smith expressed concerns that the party's stance may lead to a sudden drop in jobs, referring to it as a cliff edge. Sir Keir has also vowed his party would ensure there are more renewable jobs and strengthen society. So I want to be clear. Everything I do, all the changes we're making, are in the service of this goal. They are grounded in a new project which understands that the Labour Party can only restore hope in Britain if we once again become the natural home for working people. The Veterans Memorial Service is taking place, marking the 79th anniversary of the D-Day landings. The Secretary for Defence, Ben Wallace, is in France for the service alongside French President Macron on the anniversary of the 1944 Normandy landings. Also in attendance is Léon Gautier, the last surviving member of the French commandos who stormed the Normandy beaches defended by Hitler's troops. SSGB News will bring you more as it happens now though. Back to Mark. Rory, thank you very much and welcome back to GB News Live. Well, Prince Harry in High Court today and uh, the uh, hearing just resuming after a break for lunch, outlining the damage that tabloid press stories had done to himself and his relationships to over the decades. The Prince claiming that articles containing information which he believed was obtained unlawfully had a destructive impact on his childhood. Well, this morning, the Duke telling the court that it seemed to me there was never any let-up in the press coverage of every detail of my childhood by the defendants, journalists and others. Well, our Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker has been uh, 
following all the evidence uh, in court today, and it's been pretty fulsome with this uh, witness statement that he gave to the court earlier, of course, uh, and it's, it's wide-ranging. But interesting now that under the cross-examination, the Mirror Group newspaper, uh, the, the KC, the, the barrister in the case, seems to be saying, well, look, a lot of this was already in the public domain. It may not have come from direct phone hacking. It was already being reported by other newspapers. And the perception in the public eye of him as a... Yeah, that seems to be one of the running themes from Mr. Andrew Green, Casey, representing Mirror Group newspapers, who has been doing a morning of forensic analysis of Prince Harry's witness statement in the High Court in London behind me. Uh, Prince Harry maintains that he's been very suspicious of the articles which are being challenged in the uh, building behind me here due to the fact that some of the journalists who had written those articles have been found previously uh, to be involved in unlawful information gathering, but none Nonetheless, Mr. Green uh, dismissed that as pure, d dismissed that even of pure speculation. Uh, he is, of course, challenging the claim. Uh, Mr. Justice Green was challenging the claim that Prince Harry felt distress uh, at the articles when they were written. Bearing in mind they were written between 1996 and 2010, and he asked Prince Harry, "Do you recall reading the article at the time of publication?" And Prince Harry said he did not want to speculate uh, on that particular point. So, following the broad uh, questioning of Prince Harry's uh, why he felt distressed over these particular articles which are being written, uh, he is going through forensically each individual article in turn, the 33 which are being tested in the high courts behind me. The first one was the upset that Prince Harry felt um, about his mother and father's divorce when the article was written in 1996. Now, Prince Harry claims that the journalists came about this information due to unlawful information gathering, in particularly phone hacking and hacking uh, his mobile phone. And the Mr. Green, Casey, representing Mirror Group newspapers, pointed out that he didn't actually get a mobile phone, according to his witness statement, uh, until 1998, when he went to Eton College. Now, Prince Harry responded to that by saying that his security team had a private landline phone in a room in Ludgrove School where he was, and also made the point that perhaps it was Princess Diana's mobile phone that was hacked to get that information. Another article was was to do with Prince William and uh, Prince Harry in 2002, missing the Queen Mother's 100th uh, birthday pageant. Uh, he maintains that, uh, again, it was unlawful information as to why uh, he, uh, they, they were writing that article. But Mr Justice Green pointed out that two other articles written by the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday had reported the facts which were given in the Mirror article two days before uh, the Mirror article came out and a week before the article came out giving the idea to Prince Harry that actually the journalist who wrote the Mirror, Mirror article got the information from other publications. And that again was a running theme uh, for uh, another article that was being challenged by uh, Mr Justice Green, uh, written by the News of the World originally about Prince Harry's uh, smoking cannabis in the early 2000s and pointing out that that was a News of the World exclusive mm. and the fact that Buckingham Palace accepted that it was um, in the public interest because Prince Harry at the time was third in line to the throne to confirm that information. And again, it's this idea that the Mirror uh, journalists got their information from other publications rather than unlawful information gathering, as Prince Harry claims. But the case but in is terms of the... this afternoon, so we'll have to see what Prince Harry comes out with. Yeah, in, in terms of the big picture, though, uh, clearly we, we're getting... Uh, an indication of just how damaging uh, the Prince uh, has seen this, not just to himself, but to his wider relationships, Chelsea Davy, of course, uh, named, uh, and friends, where clearly the suspicion was, if uh, it wasn't uh, some kind of eavesdropping or phone hacking and so on, were friends and family actually speaking directly to reporters? Well, that is, of course, one of the questions which uh, Mr Justice Green is asking Prince Harry about. There was not another article referring to uh, a birthday party in Chelsea, which Prince Harry uh, attended with a number of friends. And uh, Prince Harry, again, claims that it is unlawful information gathering, which is what led to the Mirror journalist writing the article about him being there. Uh, and Mr Justice Green pointed out that perhaps the uh, the the, the 
bar manager even would have had contact with the journalist to tell him where uh, he was. So it's a lot of, it's basically the, uh, Mr Justice Green, the barrister representing Mirror Group newspapers, was giving Pintari this idea that it was indeed speculation that it was unlawful information gathering that Prince Harry uh, is claiming rather than solid facts. Now, Prince Harry maintains that a lot of the phone hacking allegations in particular were done at the time, from his understanding, by using a burner phone and therefore would be untraceable and there would be no concrete evidence. But nonetheless, Prince Harry feels there is very much a case to answer from Mirror Group newspapers, which is why he has decided to take this all the way to trial. Uh, rather than settle out of court, as others have done so previously. Mirror Group newspapers have admitted uh, to one case of unlawful information gathering when it comes to uh, Prince Harry, and they have offered their unreserved apology for that, but they are disputing all the other claims here today in court. Yeah, and, and talking of going all the way, I mean, more evidence this afternoon and an indication, as you say, that it could go into tomorrow because, of course, we remember that the prince had not turned up for that first day of, of evidence and the judge saying that the uh, Mirror Group uh, team could have as long as they wanted, effectively. Yeah, I mean, Prince Harry has been speaking for two and a half hours so far this morning, and they've got through five or maybe six uh, different articles of the 33 which are being tested in this trial. The judge had said at the preliminary hearing to this case that he would prefer it if witnesses were available the day before they were due to give evidence in case the opening statements ran short, and therefore there wouldn't be any time wasted. But due to Princess Lilibet's birthday uh, across the Atlantic in Los Angeles, Prince Harry was not in court yesterday yesterday for the first day uh, of his or of this particular trial and today is the first day uh, the ju ju Mr uh, Ale uh, Andrew Green KC representing Mirror Group newspapers has had a chance to cross examine him yeah. yesterday Mr Green said he wanted a day and a half to cross examine Prince Harry I suspect perhaps it could go on slightly longer although we'll have to wait and see what the judge says at the end of today's proceedings OK, Cameron, thank you for that. But let's uh, speak now to uh, Royal Commentator and, of course, former Royal Correspondent. So he's been at the, the sharp end, the very sharp end, some would say, Michael Cole, uh, joining us in the studio. Michael, thank you for your time once more. Um, just to, to look at the, the dynamic here in this hearing and, and what uh, Prince Harry has said in this witness statement, this very comprehensive witness statement, a general comment about the power of the press and claiming that police and government were scared to hold them accountable. The witness statement saying, my view is how can anybody possibly trust a media organisation that enjoys the liberties of free press when their own legal people and board covers up the truth? So apart from the specifics that's being examined in, in, or cross-examined, he's obviously trying to get this out into the public arena in this legalistic setting. What we're hearing and those who are there are seeing is Prince Harry presenting his truth. The hurt is raw. The belief is real. Mm -hmm. The anger is incendiary. But belief is not proof. And this case has to turn on proof and proof needs evidence. And however sympathetic the judge may be to him, However, he might sympathise mm. with what he's gone through throughout his life. It's going to turn on the evidence and whether it can be proven. Now, Cameron ha has summed up this morning, I read through the exchanges, and in all of those exchanges, when he was given the opportunity to come forward with proof, he couldn't do so. It's very, very difficult. He's fallen back on saying, well, it could have happened, or I believe it happened, or this may have happened, or that may have happened. But they need specific proof, and that is his problem. We all know, having covered major cases, it all turns round on cross-examination. Yeah. And it's going to do that, and I think, it's, I think Cameron's quite right. I think it's going to go on longer than tomorrow. Yes. So no transcripts of phone conversations, no electronic records of phone numbers or um, details of phones and so on. But just give us an idea of when you were on the road mm. about the lengths that reporters would go to, or indeed the other dark arts that could be employed, which, yes, intrusive, 
but technically not illegal? Well, uh, there were limits, very strong limits. Uh, of course, in this country, what you could do w was very limited. And there was, shall we say, discretion and good taste. Uh, as well. Uh, if anything was done which was vile, it was usually done by somebody who was not a member of, uh, of the, the press corps. Right. Well, I mean, the paparazzi are just thugs with, with cameras. Mm. And, and I can tell you that there was a collective sigh of relief uh, when Diana, uh, Princess of Wales, tragically died in the tunnel, the Alma Tunnel in Paris, that uh, around Fleet Street, that they had none of the photographers there were working, were working yeah, for yeah. any of those. Of course, they, the pictures were sent to them, mm -hmm. and in a late show of discretion and perhaps good taste, they didn't publish them, but they put them in the safe. No, we always knew you couldn't go too far. I mean, you know, you could, you, you could, uh, you could write quite razor-edged pieces if it was required, but you didn't infringe... Uh, 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 the the privacy of, of the particularly the children. Yeah. Uh, there were limits. People had discretion. They had good taste, and they, they knew uh, that it wasn't done. And would it be that cases or, or, or stories were put into the public domain in certain cases where the the various royal pal palaces would believe this is going to be helpful to a degree. Yeah, I mean, there was briefings went on. Of course, there had to be, you know, before a, a trip to China or Russia or wherever yeah, it was. The soft we, diplomacy. There, there was, yes, that people were briefed and, uh, you know, there were contacts which you had and people were, to a gr greater or larger degree, uh, uh, helpful mm. uh, when they, they thought it was there. But, of course, people did have contacts and, and the uh, individual members of the royal family, some of them got on very well with certain members of the press and they helped them and so on and so forth. It was a, a relationship. Most of the time it worked. Uh, it was vanishingly rare for anybody to ever actually make up a story. I can yes. assure you that. There was no need for it. Yeah, because, because clearly, you know, the, there were um, channels where the, the palace could have actually call people to account for, for that particular of course. Uh, discretion. Of course, of course. Indiscretion, rather. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was accredited at Buckingham Palace. Uh, that meant I could park my rover, my BBC Red Rover 216 in the courtyard, and I could walk in the Prithy Purse door almost whenever I wanted to and go and speak to people, apart from Her Majesty the Queen, yes. I could go and talk to people. And that access was very valuable and very uh, v valuable for them. It was, you know... But it was understood that you then followed the rules of the game. Absolutely. Listen, in this country, the monarch rules with the consent of the people. And the major way in which the monarch communicates with all the people is through radio, television, mm. the press, and personal appearances. And, of course, they welcome the coverage of what they do. That is how they communicate with people. And that's all, you know, arranged in a certain way. It's very rare for one member of the royal family, and it's uh, not, not, not encouraged to do something on the day that another member of the royal family is doing something that they regard as important. It's a relationship that has no written rules, no. but everybody knows the rules of the game. Last reflection on this, and, and obviously we, we've got the, the case resuming this afternoon. We understand that, that King Charles said, you know, maybe not wise to go ahead with this, suicidal, I think, was one oh, of the phrases oh, used. Oh. And certainly William has had a different approach, even though we understand there's been an out-of-court settlement in a different yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. Well, if Her Majesty the Queen was here, I'm sure she would have said to Harry, please do not do this. There's a very good reason why no member of the royal family has gone into the witness box since uh, 1892, Over I think it was. Game, I Over a card game. Over a card game. Baccarat. And And what is interesting now is that Prince Harry is getting even his book, Spare, published on the 10th of January, mm. quoted back to him by Andrew Green, the counsel, uh, for the Mirror Group newspapers, mm. because that book is replete with uh, his confessions about smoking weed, taking drugs, getting wasted, and all the rest of it. It yeah. goes on and on and on. In fact, it's so repetitive, you don't want to read it. And that's coming back to haunt him. In a way, uh, you know, I feel sorry for him in many, many ways. I, you know what I think about? I think about the four little four-year-old boy on his first day at uh, Mrs. Miner's nursery school, about 100, 150 yards away from where we're sitting now, coming out, having made a finger puppet for his mum and running home to show it to her at four years old. And I think about him serving this country valiantly uh, on two tours of duty in Afghanistan. He, he was a happy prince. He was a good boy. He was actually uh, somebody you could actually respect and get on with. Something 
has got into his soul, I, I feel very, very sh sorry to see that it's come to this. But quite clearly, he has his complaint, he wants his day in court, he's having it, and I think uh, by the time we get to the end of it, we'll know rather more. If there had been a jury sympathetic oh, good, to him... Yes, good, good point. If then, there had been a jury, I think it would be different. Yeah. The fact is that it's a judge only, and the judge will have to go on the evidence, and he's got to produce the evidence. Mm. On the balance of probability, as we remember. D very different thing to the jury being persuaded. But, uh, Michael, thank you for that. And, of course, those abiding images that you've got uh, <laughs> of, of the prince. Uh, coming up, the UK uh, to offer further humanitarian and economic support to Ukraine after that huge dam in the south of the country was destroyed. The clear-up and, indeed, the recovery and rescue operation still underway. We'll update you shortly. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers <laughs> tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion. Looking at the week before, and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Now, welcome back. Uh, the UK saying it's to offer further humanitarian and economic support to Ukraine after that huge dam in the south of the country uh, was destroyed. Uh, major evacuations and rescue operations uh, in uh, action at the moment. But this was the time of the explosion uh, with an extraordinary picture of the white out there and then the huge mushroom cloud indicating the strength of the blast that breached that damn wall. Well, the result is that cities, towns and villages in the region are facing significant flooding. The flood water, there we are, rising as it breaches that dam with uh, that huge flow of the Dnipro, into the Dnipro River. In response, Russia has accused Ukraine of the attack, while Ukrainian President Zelensky tweeted a short time ago that Russia has been controlling the dam and the entire hydroelectric power plant for more than a year. It's physically impossible to blow it up somehow from the outside by shelling. 
It was mined, he said, by the Russian occupiers, and they blew it up. Well, let's get the latest now with our security editor, Mark White, joining us uh, in the studio. The aftermath, of course, Mark, is that tens of thousands of people were being told being moved to safety um, and, of course, a direct consequence on the military operations for, for both sides as well. Yeah, I mean, it's an unfolding disaster for those in the path of the floodwater uh, all of the time, these communities. Some 80 settlements were told in direct line of the flooding and some of the consequences already been seen with like, houses that are just being swept along by uh, the, the torrent of water uh, out of the area. And also uh, reports now coming in that mines, live mines that have been planted along the river banks, either by Russians or Ukrainians, are being scooped up by the water and they're floating downstream. In fact, there are, I don't know if we can show it, this is... Well, we see this house on yeah, the yeah. houses being Extraordinary, floating down. But we also have some uh, video uh, taken on a mobile phone that shows uh, the moment that one of those mines that's been floating down the water at explodes as well, which gives an indication of the dangers to uh, those people. This is that footage now, Mark. You see in just a second, there's uh, off an explosion. It goes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these mines that are planted just below the surface, because the flood water's raging down, it's scooping that top layer of soil off. The mines are floating to the surface and then going down river and, of course, right into the path of people and houses and, uh, you know, anyone yeah. in its and, path. And villages, towns, even the city of Kherson, so a huge area. Uh, and, as of course, we've seen from the strength of the floodwater, people losing their shelter and, and homes. So there will be a, a massive humanitarian operation to be undertaken, as well as this the military offensive, with the UK saying, well, you know, we are preparing to, to give you more support and more help. Yes, and I think the thing to bear in mind here is this is just not just affecting uh, the Ukrainian side. This is also affecting Russian-occupied territory on the southeastern side of the Dnipro River, uh, as well as the northwestern side, which is Ukrainian territory, such as the, the large city of Kherson. Well, the Kukova, the town of Kukova, where the dam gets its name from and mm. the reservoir gets its name from, is also under many feet of water as well, with lots, thousands of people in that region being evacuated. So it's not just affecting the Ukrainians, it's also affecting those in the Russian-held areas. Yeah, and one should perhaps just reflect that, you know, the Russians are saying, no, it wasn't us, and the Ukrainians saying, well, we've had no control over the dam, so how on earth could we be involved? But, yeah, direct military com uh, uh, consequences now for both sides. As we see the, the Dnipro River, of course, which is this uh, very effective barrier uh, for any army to try and cross, because, of course, we know that that, yes, offensives are underway elsewhere in Ukraine. Yeah, well, the Dnipro River has effectively become the front line. Yeah, yeah. Because, as you say, it is that natural barrier. So you have troops in areas massed on either side of the river. And, of course, for Ukraine to regain and recapture territory taken by the Russians, they've got to get over that river. One of the ways over would have been uh, on the road and the railway that ran across the top of this dam, ah. now impassable. Now, that, could that explain the actual location of that particular explosion? Because it's not just the dam itself, it's what goes over the top of the dam wall. That's right, yes, there's a road and a rail track running right along at the top of the dam. So, yes, it could have been exploded by the Russians to cause uh, a great deal of damage down the Dnipro River to tie up Ukrainian forces, but more strategically, it could have been taken out to stop Ukrainian forces from proceeding and pushing forward onto the Russian side yeah. of the Dnipro River. So there, there may well be a military um, reason for, for some kind of, of uh, attack on it, because clearly the, the uh, European Council has said, no, this, uh, we believe, is directly a war crime, it's civilian infrastructure. And, of course, we now have James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, saying, well, we are now standing and, and preparing to, to give yet more help for humanitarian reasons. Yes, exactly. There could be a military imperative here in terms of the 
the way in which Russia is acting, if it is indeed Russia that has blown up this particular dam. Because what you've got with the Ukrainians, of course, is a force that, yes, of course, they've been given a lot of new NATO uh, technology and equipment, uh, tanks and heavy artillery yeah. and alike. Many of the troops have been trained uh, in NATO countries uh, to take this counter-offensive to the Russians. But what they don't have is the ability to jump across the river. They don't have air superiority. They don't have the heavy lift helicopters and other transport planes yeah. that could get some of this heavy artillery and um, the, tanks they've got and to the like of the river. The so ground, they've got yeah. to go yeah. uh, on the bridges. And of course, this dam was effectively a bridge across the river now, as well. We remember uh, the, the historians certainly saying that one of the major consequences of the dam busters raid back in the Second World War was the amount of, of uh, German uh, manpower and military power that it took to actually clean up the operation. Could this be a direct consequence now that maybe part of this sort of um, uh, military uh, effort will, will be diverted to helping people and, and, and rescuing people and so on? Yeah, well, that's a good point because President Zelensky has already said yeah. that members of the military are helping in and around Kherson to get people out of the worst affected areas. So there's no doubt at all that the first order uh, of the day has to be to preserve life. And when they're in direct flood of these floodwaters coming down, you can see that's yeah. uh, a local policeman. Yeah, just some pictures coming in, not, not military, but certainly police uh, rescuing some children there. And, and, of course, this will be across a huge area at the moment, yeah. these sorts of things going on. Absolutely. And it will only worsen because the floodwaters continue uh, to pour into this region. So the further south you go in the Dnipro Valley, then the more places that will flood yeah. and the more people that will be at risk. Mark, thank you very much for taking us through all that. Of course, more pictures, uh, more updates as we get them on that changing situation in Ukraine itself. Also coming up, Mar Margaret Ferrier suspended from the House of Commons for 30 days. Does that mean Labour could try and take her seat north of the border? Uh, latest on that coming up, but now the news uh, headlines uh, with Rory. Thank you very much, Mark. Prince Harry accuses the British government of being at rock bottom. The Duke of Sussex is giving evidence in London against the publisher of the Daily Mirror over alleged unlawful information gathering. He said, our country is judged globally by the state of our press and our government. He also accuses the press of having blood on their hands during his cross-examination at the High Court. Mirror Group newspapers denies all allegations. Downing Street says the government is willing to agree another way forward rather than taking legal action against the COVID inquiry. The inquiry asked the Cabinet Office to return former Prime Minister Boris Johnson's notebooks to him by June the 12th to compare them to the redacted copies already provided. Inquiry Chair Baroness Heather Hallett says she will not be commenting on the legal row due to pending litigation. All boat operations have been suspended off Burnmouth Pier following the death of two young swimmers last week. A local council spokesperson says it's pending a conclusion to the police investigation. An inquest into the deaths of the youngsters heard they were part of a group thought to have been caught up in a riptide in the sea. Post-mortem examination proceedings are adjourned until September. Ryanair has cancelled 400 flights today amid a French air traffic controller strike. Some of the impacted flights are to and from the UK and Ireland. A petition calling for the European Commission to protect flights over France during their strikes has so far been signed by over 1.1 million people. That's the up to date, but you can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website. That is gbnews.com. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. 
People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely <laughs> unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, Margaret Ferrier has been suspended for the House of Commons for 30 days for breaching coronavirus rules. The Commons voting 185 to 40, a majority of 145, to approve the motion to suspend her as an independent MP for Rother Glen and Hamilton West. But, of course, she uh, stood as an SNP uh, MP uh, but could face a by-election as a result of this uh, to... Remind you, she breached COVID rules back in 2020 after travelling by train uh, to uh, get uh, back to Glasgow, but hadn't, having proved positive for the coronavirus, uh, uh, and therefore uh, she uh, obviously breached the COVID rules and parliamentary rules too. Well, joining us is our deputy political editor, Tom Harwood. Just to reiterate, Tom, the, the consequence of this, anything above a 10-day suspension mm -hmm. can trigger a by-election. Um, she's no longer sitting as a, an SNP MP, but clearly Labour think they could gain the seat from the SNP, given that her majority was only, what, 5,200 and odd. That's right. This is a, a, a crucible of Scottish yeah. politics in, in this seat of Rutherglen and Hamilton West. It voted 50-50, yes and no, in the independence referendum right. back in 2015. 14, and it's flipped in the last three general elections between the SNP in 2015, when they won it off Labour, in 2017, Labour won it off the SNP again, and in 2019, the SNP won it off Labour again. So it's a real sort of uh, bellwether of the mood yeah. of Scotland. And, and, and for Labour, you know, they've got to win these Scottish seats to actually make sure they get a, a victory in a general election. They really do. Keir Starmer has said it many times mm. that the path to Downing Street runs through Scotland. And current polling would suggest that Labour have been improving in Scotland, are doing much better now than they were last year, benefiting from the chaos within the SNP. So this will be a really, really 
really important test for Keir Starmer if, of course, this by-election goes ahead. And the way it would happen is that uh, a recall petition can now be brought because uh, that suspension has been agreed by the Commons, voted on by the Commons, uh, and 10% of the number of uh, voters that live in that constituency would have to sign that petition right. and then the by-election can take place. And just to remind people, I mean, the Standards Committee of the Commons recommended back in March she should be suspended. Mm. An independent panel then upholding that judgment after she appealed against mm. it. Mm. The panel concluding she'd acted with blatant and deliberate dishonest intent, a high degree of recklessness to the public and to colleagues and staff at the House of Commons. Well, let's... Apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> let's not forget the timeline of what actually happened. Back in September 2020, uh, Margaret Ferrier thought that she had COVID. She mm. thought so much that she booked a test and took that test, after which you, of course, are supposed to isolate. Instead of isolating, she went to the gym, then she went to a beauty salon, then she went to a gift shop, and then she travelled hundreds of miles from her London place of residence back up to her constituency. On the train. On the train. Yeah. So it's not even doing a Dominic Cummings in your private family car. It is really... Testing uh, your it's, eyesight. It's, it's, yeah. uh, um, uh, and then she spoke in a parliamentary debate as well. Uh, really quite blatantly reckless behaviour for which she was found guilty. She actually pled guilty and, and, and uh, carried out community service. Yes, two, uh, 270 hours, I think, wasn't it? Um, I, I guess, effectively, her political career is over now. Uh, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Uh, she has been, remember, not sitting as an SNP MP for almost two years now. She was uh, removed from that party. She's been sitting as an independent since. And, uh, and really, since uh, late 2020, the SNP... Or early 2021, the SNP have been uh, saying that she should do the right thing and stand yeah, yeah, down yeah. from Parliament. So it, it is the SNP calling for her to, uh, to have this by-election well, as well I mean, as that, the other parties. Well, that's an interesting point, because her... her original party has said, no, she should actually stand down mm. and there should be a by-election. But, of course, what feeds in, then, is what's happened to the SNP mm. since she was originally well, elected. Well, if she had stood down at the time at which this took place, more than two years ago, mm. uh, the SNP would likely have held the seat. They were yeah. polling much, much strong, more strongly uh, in Scotland than they are today. And, crucially, the Labour Party was polling a lot more weakly in Scotland than it is now. But since then, of course, there's been a lot of internal consternation within the SNP. There's been a leadership change and, indeed, big, big questions over their financial yeah, yeah. propriety. So um, this is a real, real opportunity for the Labour Party uh, in this bellwether season. Any announcement from Humza Yousaf, the, the new party, or newish party leader? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, I think <laughs> we, we, what we will see now on the ground is organisation. Right. Um, it, there will be uh, parties that are, that are putting about this recall petition, contacting as many people as possible uh, for it to be signed. But also, interestingly, the, the Labour Party has already selected their candidate for the so next often running general already. election. Right. But also because they expected this by-election to happen. Uh, this was not an unexpected okay. thing uh, th that has been voted and on by... And this large result will be seen as a bellwether for the general election, we think? I, I think it will be seen as a real indicator, the first indicator, perhaps, of where politics in Scotland lies. Because uh, we haven't really had a big test of the SNP yeah, since yeah. Nicola Sturgeon resigned. Uh, there hasn't been local elections in Scotland, there have been in England. This will be the first election electoral test of where the SNP stands after the resignation yeah. of the uh, And, of course, significant because it's a Westminster seat rather than uh, being an a MSP, a member of the Scottish Parliament. Exactly. Such. So, thank you for taking us through that, and we'll see what emerges, of course, in these uh, coming days and weeks on that particular uh, aspect of that constituency. Now, uh, today we're marking 79 years since one of the most significant events of World War II. Uh, D-Day and Operation Overlord recognised as having played a crucial role in the Allies eventually defeating Germany. So important, indeed, that we we mark the day every year in recognition of those who gave their lives for our freedom. Well, our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper has been speaking to a D-Day veteran who landed on those beaches of Normandy back on that day in 1944. Under the air cover, the great fleet of little ships marched on. 79 years ago came the beginning to the end of World War II. So great was the speed of this advance that the retreating Germans were never given the chance to get organised. On the 6th of June, 1944, 
what's now known as D-Day, took place. Tens of thousands of Allied troops invaded the beaches of Normandy by land, air and sea. Just one of those was Bernard Morgan. The thing I remember mostly, and I should never forget, is seeing our troops digging the dead bodies out of the sand on the Normandy beaches. Bernard enlisted on his 18th birthday, determined to play his part. He was trained up as a code breaker, and on D-Day, he was the youngest RAF sergeant to land in Normandy. We were anchored seven miles off the uh, coast on the, on the night before D-Day. Our battleships were behind us. They were firing at the Atlantic Wall. The Atlantic Wall were firing back, and I had to man a Bren gun for two hours on the deck of this landing ship tank. And uh, I tell the truth, I was very frightened. As a trained code breaker, Bernard had access to a telex, a device used during World War II to communicate electronically. As a result, he knew that the war was coming to an end two days before VE Day. Well, we couldn't believe it when we got this message to say the war would finish in two days' time. Nobody to be advised at all. It gave us a great thrill to think that we'd be playing a part in it and our little bit had helped to bring it to an end. Now, almost eight decades later, and Bernard still works regularly with the Royal British Legion to remember his fallen comrades. I always think of the poor lads who gave their lives for the freedom that we enjoy today. Sailors, soldiers, airmen and civilians who gave their lives so that we could live a free life. They're the ones who are, I call the heroes. Flower Deck Memorials speak of the gratitude of a whole people. To the world will, of course, always remember D-Day, a day that made all the difference in winning the Second World War. Sophie Reaper, GB News. Remembering those beaches of Normandy on uh, that longest day back in 1944. Now, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer has been addressing the GMB Union Conference, pledging uh, backing for plans to shift to green energy as part of a, a new business model for Britain, but persuading the unions to seize the opportunities of hydrogen power or carbon capture. Uh, he's been trying not to repeat past mistakes too when challenged over plans to ban any new oil or gas licences in the North Sea. Uh, the GMB's boss said it puts jobs on a cliff edge. Let's get more now with our business and economics editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. So we're, we're trying to add up how he's um, <laughs> vowing to protect communities from uh, withering uh, jobs or decimation while still saying no more licences for oil or gas in the North Sea. How do the two marry? And at the same time, marrying up, Mark, no more licences for oil and gas drilling in the North Sea while admitting to the GMB, Britain's third biggest union, at their annual conference in Brighton today, that the UK would carry on using oil and gas, quotes, way, way into the future. It, you know, opposition is a lot easier than government, <laughs> but opposition does start to get tough yeah. when you start laying out policies in as, the, detail. as the drum beats start for a general election and then various factions and parts of your party don't like it. Look, what's happening here is you've got an absolute clash between the two wings, if you like, of the coalition that is the modern Labour Party. You've got the blue-collar, uh, traditional wings of the Labour Party, the unionised Labour part, mm. and they don't like the fact that the Labour Party wants to end all new oil and gas exploration in the North Sea. The North Sea oil and gas industry, by the way, which provides 75% of our energy yeah. and which employs there and across the country, 200,000 people. Then you've got the other part of the Labour Party, which is the more metropolitan, more graduate-educated, uh, more university town-located, sort of right-on green part of the Labour Party, and they're saying, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Keir Starmer's getting plaudits from, and, and... you know... Uh, 
uh, RSPB and Friends of the Earth and Just Stop Oil. Yeah, and Ed Miliband, of course, having put in, in train this uh, green policy, this, this green um, sort of uh, trunk reading through the energy policy for the Labour Party. But I guess the other thing, and this is interesting, the GMB has touched on this, it's the emotive issue, of course, to what happened to the coal mining communities when coal mining was stopped. Um, you know, north of England, north east, Wales and, and so on, parts of Scotland. Uh, and they don't want to see a repeat of that. It's unbelievable, really, Mark. You and I talked about this yesterday. Uh, Sharon Graham, who runs the Unite Trade Union, which is the second biggest union in the country, huge bankroller of Labour, it, it, she, she, she recalled, in the context of, of Labour's policy now on oil and gas, she said, we can't make the same mistakes that the Tories made during the 1980s when they wiped out big parts of the coal industry, when, you know, communities were decimated from the South Wales Valleys to Nottingham, obviously to Yorkshire, sparked that huge industrial action. And so what Keir Starmer said at the GMB conference today, the General Municipal and Boilermakers Union conference today, mm. is he tried to sort of change the angle of attack, if you like. He started talking about nationalisation, he started talking about public ownership, not of existing oil and gas companies. He wants to create a new oil and gas company, a new energy provider called GB Energy, nothing to do with GB News, called GB Energy, that he says will champion the needs of consumers. Right. Here he is. Because we're Labour, it is a plan for working people, their jobs and their prosperity. We will create a new company, GB Energy, and through that vehicle, we will take advantage of the opportunities that we have. And because it's right for jobs, because it's right for growth, because it's right for energy independence, then yes, it will be publicly owned. And did the conference buy it? Well, there was, there was some applause. Oh, well. Um, but look, this... You've got a Labour leader here. He's ahead in the opinion polls. There's some survey evidence out showing that he's now started to rank higher as a potential Prime Minister than Rishi Sunak. So that's, not just the party position, but the leader's that's that, position. That's, yeah, that's right. a reversal, because, of course, yeah, yeah. the Tories are having lots of difficulties and Labour are starting to roll out some policies. But when you start rolling out some policies as a Labour leader, that's when you know, the left of your party starts to get really upset. You know, you've got all these concerns at the moment about what Labour's going to do on tax, but in particular, it's the green agenda. I do think that Overton window, if you like, the debate about net zero is now starting to shift. Yeah. We've got car makers in Germany. Electric cars, we've got, absolutely. We've got car yeah. makers yeah. in Germany pushing mm. the German government, a very green government by our standards, to put further into the future that ban on new um, petrol and diesel cars, yeah. and they've been successful in that. You've got the trade unions now pushing a back against an absolute ban on new oil and gas exploration. You've got other people from the red wall seats, both Labour and Tory, saying, look, this stuff, heat pumps, really? Can working families afford heat pumps? So I do think you're going to have to get some more reality yeah. injected into Labour's rhetoric. And, of course, let's not forget that the unions have to be on side because they are a major financer well, they are, of but the on Labour the Party. They, they are a major financer of the Labour Party. On the other hand, one reason maybe why Keir Starmer is feeling a bit emboldened that he doesn't always have to do the union's bidding yeah. is that he's getting money from elsewhere. Right. Uh, there's a Renewables. There's, a, there's a very successful renewable entrepreneur yeah. called Dale Vince. Yep, yep. And on the front page of the FT a couple of days ago, news, he's going he's gonna to drop a cool five million quid on the Labour Party between now and the general election. As well as a few bob to just stop oil. Focused, yeah, yeah focused yeah. not just on environmental concerns, which are very close to his heart, but also on reversing Brexit. So can you imagine what's going to happen if Keir Starmer starts talking about reversing Brexit? How's that going to go down among Red Wall MPs? Because yeah. those Red Bull Labour MPs know that that policy would not be yeah. welcome. I think he's, he's talked about a reset with uh, with Europe, but I think uh, going that extra mile uh, or kilometre uh, might be a bit too much. Well, the Lib really, the Lib yeah. Dems have said they want Brexit without even a, want to reverse Brexit without even a referendum. Yeah.
democracy in action not. <laughs> uh, anyway, Liam, thank you for taking us uh, through all that. And um, we'll be taking you through the, for the rest of the afternoon a certain uh, case at the High Court, yes. Prince Harry still being uh, cross-examined on his evidence uh, in that uh, case involving Mirror Group newspapers. Um, indications, of course, that uh, Andrew Green, the KC for the Mirror Group, uh, is saying that uh, a lot of this is conjecture, uh, not evidence, as he said. But the judge will have to decide in the coming uh, weeks in terms of the balance of probability. We'll have all the latest from outside the court with Cameron. Patrick's with you next. Stay with us on GB News. It's D-Day in Prince Harry's war against the media as he became the first royal to give courtroom evidence since the 19th century. But did he strike a decisive blow in his mission to silence freedom of speech about the rich and famous? We'll recreate Harry's bombshell testimony and my royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell, Tom Bower and Paul Burrell, will deliver the unflinching analysis and exclusive reporting you won't find anywhere in the MSM. Harry's evidence, the verdict on Dan Wharton tonight from 9pm to 11pm, only on GB News. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, it's 3pm, it's Patrick Christie's, it's GB News and it is an absolutely massive day for Prince Harry in court. And so far he is being picked apart. Lots of feelings, lots of his truth, but crucially, as yet,